of Henry IV Part Two. We did Henry IV Part One a couple of weeks ago, and here we are bringing Part Two because Shakespeare writes sequels. Um, uh, tonight we have a fantastic group of actors ready to go, and we are uh, going to get rolling here in just a minute. Before we get too far, I want to remind you that many of our actors consider the Center for Performing Arts in Rhinebeck to be our theatrical home in better times, and better times are finally coming. The Center for Performing Arts in Rhinebeck has announced that they will be opening an outdoor production of Midsummer Night's Dream on July 7th. Uh, and considering that, Living Room Shakespeare has set shows for next Saturday and the following Saturday, which are the last two Saturdays in June. And the show at the end of June will be our season finale. We're not going away forever, but we're going to take a few weeks off and let the run of Midsummer Night's Dream happen. And then we'll come back with something down the road. So please enjoy tonight's production of Henry IV Part Two, and join us for the next couple of weeks. And then please, please, please go to the center Give them your money directly for theater. It will be amazing. Um, without further ado, we will begin with the prologue of tonight's show. Open your ears, for which of you will stop the vent of hearing when loud rumor speaks? I, the orient to the drooping west, Marking the wind, my post horse still unfolds the axe commenced on this ball of earth. Upon my tongues, continual slanders ride, the which in every language I pronounce, stuffing the ears of men with false reports. I speak of peace, while enmity converts under the smile of safety and wounds the world. And who but rumor, who but only I make fearful musters and prepared defense, whilst the big year, swollen with some other grief, is thought with child by the stern tyrant war, and no such matter. Rumor is a pipe blown by surmises, jealousies, conjectures, and of so easy and so plain a stop that blunt monster with uncounted heads that still discordant wavering multitude can play upon it. But what need I thus my well-known body to anatomize among my household? Why is rumor here? I run before King Harry's victory who in a bloody field by Shrewsbury hath beaten down young Hotspur and his troops, quenching the flame of blood, rebellion, even with the rebel's blood. But what mean I to speak so true at first? My office is to nose abroad that Harry Monmouth fell under the wrath of noble Hotspur's sword, and that the king before the Douglas rage stooped his anointed head, so low as death. By rumors through the peasant towns between the royal field of Shrewsbury and the worm-eaten hold of ragged stone where Hotspur's father, Old Northumberland, lies crafty sick. The posts come tiring on, and not a man of them brings other news than they have learned of me. From rumor's tongues, they bring smooth comforts false, worse and true wrongs. Act one, scene one. Who keeps the gate here? Ho, oh, where is the Earl? Who keeps the gate here? Ho, oh, where is the Earl? What, shall I say you are? Tell thou the Earl that the Lord Bardolph doth attend him here. Uh, his Lordship has walked forth into the orchard. Please it your honor knock, but at the gate, and he himself will answer. Uh, here comes the Earl. For news, Lord Bardolph, every minute now. Should be the father of some stratagem. The times are wild. Contention like a horse, full of high feeding. Madly has broke loose and bears on all before him. Noble Earl, 
I bring you certain news from Shrewsbury. Good news, and God will. As good as heart can wish. The king is almost wounded to the death, and in the fortune of my lord, your son, Prince Harry slain outright, and both the blunts killed by the hand of Douglas. Young Prince John and Westmoreland and Stafford fled the field, and Harry Monmouth's brawn, the Hulk, Sir John, is prisoner to your son. Oh, such a day, so fought, so followed, and so fairly won, came not till now to dignify the times since Caesar's fortunes. How is this derived? Saw you in the field? Came you from Shrewsbury? I spake with one, my lord, that came from thence, a gentleman well-bred and of good nature, that freely rendered me these news for true. Here comes my servant Travis, whom I sent on Tuesday last to listen up to news. My lord, I overrode him on the way, and he is furnished with no certainties more than he haply may retail from me. Now, Travis, what good tidings come with you? My lord, uh, Sir John Umfrill turned me back with joyful tidings, and being better horsed, outrode me. After him came spurring hard a gentleman, almost forespent with speed, that stopped by me to breathe his bloodied horse. He asked the way to Chester, and of him I did demand what news from Shrewsbury. He told me that rebellion had bad luck, and that young Harry Percy's spurs were cold. With that, he gave his able horse the head, and bending forward, struck his armored heels against the panting sides of his poor jade up to the rowel head. And starting so, he seemed in running to devour that way, staying no longer question. <sighs> Again, said so Hugh Young, Harry Percy's spur was cold. Of Hosper Coldspur, that rebellion had met ill luck. My lord, I'll tell you what. If my young lord, your son, have not the day, upon mine honor, for a silken point, I'll give my barony. Never talk of it. Why should that gentleman that rode by travers give such instances of laws? Oh, he, he, he was some hilding fellow that had stolen the horse he rode on, and upon my life, Spoke at a venture. Oh, look, uh, here comes more news. Yeah, this man's brow like a tidal leaf, but tells the nature of a tragic volume. So looks the strand of whereupon the imperious flood has left a witness usurpation. Say, Morton, didst thou come from Shrewsbury? I ran from Shrewsbury, my noble lord, where a hateful death put on his ugliest mask to fright our party. Oh, that's my son and brother. O oh, tremblous, and the white is in thy cheek. It's absurd than thy tongue to tell thy errand. I put such a man so faint, so spiritless, so dull, so dead in look, so woe begun, drew Pyrrhim's curtain in a dead of night. Oh, Lord, I told him half his Troy was burned, but Pyrrhim found the fire he was tongued, and I my Percy's death ere thou reposed it. This I would say, your son, the thus and thus, your brother thus, so far the noble Douglas, stopping my greedy ear with their bold deeds, but in the end to stop my ear indeed. God has a signs to blow away this praise, and in which brother, son, and all are dead. Douglas is living, and your brother yet, but for my lord, your son. Oh, he's dead. See what a ready tongue suspicion has. He that but fears the thing he will not know is by instinct knowledge from others' eyes. That will he fear his chance. Yes, speak, Morton. Tell that an oro his divination lies, and I will take it as a sweet disgrace and make three men make thee rich for doing me such wrong. You are too great to be by me gainsaid. Your spirit is too true, your fears too certain. Yet for all this, say not that Percy is dead. I see a strange confession in thy eye. Thou shakest thy head and hold a fear for sin, to speak a truth. If he be slain, say so. The tongue offends not that reports his death. And he does sin that does belie the dead. Not he which says the dead is not alive. 
the first bringer of unwelcome news as but a losing office, and his tongue sounds ever after a sullen bell, remembering tolling of a departing friend. I cannot think, my lord, your son is dead. I am sorry I should force you to believe that which I would to God I had not seen. But these mine eyes saw him in bloody state, rendering face quittance, wearied and out breath to Harry Monmouth, whose swift wrath beat down the never daunted Percy to the earth, from whence with life he never more sprung up. In few his death, whose spirit lent a fire even to the dullest peasant in his camp, being brooted once took fire and heat away from the best-tempered courage in his troops, for from his metal was his party steeled, which once in him abated all the rest, turned on themselves like dull and heavy lead, as the thing that's heavy in itself upon enforcement flies with greatest speed. So did our men, heavy in Hotspur's loss, lend to this weight such lightness with their fear that arrows fled not swifter toward their aim than did our soldiers, aiming at their safety, fly from the field. Then was the noble Worcester too soon taken prisoner, and that furious Scot, the bloody Douglas, whose well-laboring sword had three times slain the appearance of the king, can veil his stomach and did grace the shame of those who turned their backs, and in his flight stumbling in fear was took. The sum of all is that the king hath won, and hath sent out a speedy power to encounter you, my lord, under the conduct of young Lancaster and Westmoreland. This is the news at full. For this I shall have time enough to mourn, in poison there in his physic and these news, having been well, that would have made me sick, being sick, having some measure made we well. And as the wrench whose fever weakened joins like strengthening hinges, buckle end of life, impatient of his fit, breaks like a fire out of his keeper's arms. Even so my limbs, weakened with grief, being now enraged with grief, and thrice renewed themselves. Hence, therefore, a nice crutch. A scaly goblin now with joints and steel must glove this hand, and hence thou quickly coiled. Thou art a guard too wanton for the head which princes flesh with conquest aim to hit. Now by my brow's iron, I'll approach the ragged hour that time and spite their bring to frown upon the enraged Northumberland. Let heaven kiss earth! Now lend our nature's hand, keep a wild flood confined. Let order die! And let this world no longer be a stage to feed contention in a lingering act. But like one spirit of the firstborn king, ring all bosoms that each heart being set on bloody courses, the rude thing may end, and darkness be the barrier of the dead. Sweet Earl, divorce not wisdom from your honor. The lives of all your loving complices lean on your health, the which, if you give o'er to stormy passion, must perforce decay. You cast the event of war, my noble lord, and summed the account of chance before you said, let us make head. It was your pre-surmise that in the dole of blows your son might drop. You knew he walked o'er perils on an edge more likely to fall in than to get o'er. You were advised his flesh was capable of wounds and scars, and that his forward spirit would lift him where most trade of danger ranged. Yet did you say, go forth, and none of this, though strongly apprehended, could restrain that stiff-born action. What hath then befallen, or what hath this bold enterprise brought forth, more than that being which was like to be? We all that are engaged to this loss knew that we ventured on such dangerous seas that if we wrought our life was ten to one. And yet we ventured, for the gain proposed choked the respect of likely peril feared. And since we are o'erset, venture again. 
come, we will all put forth body and goods. It is more than time. And, my most noble lord, I hear for certain, and do speak the truth, the gentle Archbishop of York is up with well-appointed powers. He is a man who with a double surety binds his followers. My lord, your son, had only but the corpse, but shadows and the shows of men to fight. For that same word, rebellion, did divide the action of their bodies from their souls. And they did fight with queasiness, constrained as men drink potions, that their weapons only seemed on our side. But for their spirits and souls, this word, rebellion, it had froze them up as fish are in a pond. But now the bishop turns insurrection to religion. Suppose sincere and holy in his thoughts, he's followed both with body and with mind, and doth enlarge his rising with the blood of fair King Richard, scraped from pomfret stones, derives from heaven his quarrel and his cause, tells them he doth bestride a bleeding land, gasping for life under the great bowling brook, and more and less do flock to follow him. I knew this before, but to speak truth, his present grief had wiped it from my mind. Go in with me, I can counsel every man that have his way for safety and revenge. Get posts and letters and make friends with speed. Never so few, I never yet more need. Act one, scene two. Sirrah, you giant. What says the doctor to my water? He said, sir, the water itself was a good healthy water, but for the party that owed it, he might have more diseases than he knew for. Men of all sorts take a pride to gird at me. The brain of this foolish compounded clay man is not able to invent anything that tends to laughter more than I invent or is invented on me. I am not only witty in myself, but the cause that wit is in other men. I do walk here before thee like a sow that hath overwhelmed all her litter but one. If the prince put thee into my service for any other reason than to set me off, well, then I have no judgment. Thou poor son, Mandrake. Thou art fitter to be worn in my cap than to wait at my heels. I was never manned with an agate till now, but I will inset you neither in gold nor silver, but in vile apparel, and send you back again to your master for a jewel. The juvenile. The prince, your master, whose chin is not yet fledged. I will sooner have a beard grow in the palm of my hand than he shall get one on his cheek. And he will not stick to say his face is a face royal. God may finish it when he will. It's not a hair amiss yet. He may keep it still at a face royal, for, for a barber shall never earn sixpence out of it. And yet he'll be crowning as if he had written man ever since his father was a bachelor. He may keep his own grace, but he's almost out of mine, I can assure him. Uh, what said Master Dumbledore about the satin for my short cloak and my slops? He said, sir, sir, you should procure him better assurance than Bartle. He would not take his band and yours. He liked not the security. Let him be damned like the glutton. Pray God his tongue be hotter. A horse or not, you awful. A rascally, yea, forsooth knave, to bear a gentleman in hand and then stand upon security. The horse on smooth pates do now wear nothing but high shoes and bunches of keys at their girdles. And if a man is through with them in honest taking up, then they must stand upon security. I had leaf they would put rat's bane in my mouth as often to stop it with security. I looked to should have sent me two and twenty yards of satin, as I am a true knight, and he sends me security. Well, he may sleep in security, for he hath hold the horn of abundance and the lightness of his wife shines through it, and yet he cannot see, though he hath his own lanthorn to light him. Where's Bardolph? He's going to Smithfield to buy your worship a horse. I bought him in Paul's, and he'll buy me a horse in Smithfield. And I could get me but a wife in the stews, I were man, horse, and wife. Sir, here comes a nobleman that committed the prince for striking him about Bardolph. Wait close. I will not see him. What's he that goes there? All step, and please your lordship. He that was in question for the robbery. He, my lord, but he hath since done good service at Shrewsbury, and, as I hear, 
is now going with some charge to the Lord John of Lancaster. What, to York? Call him back again. Sir John Falstaff. Boy, tell him I am deaf. You must speak louder. My master is deaf. I'm sure he is, to the hearing of any good thing. Go, pluck him by the elbow. I must speak with him. Sir John. What? A young knave and begging? Is there not wars? Is there not employment? Doth not the king lack subjects? Doth not the rebels need soldiers? Though it be a shame to be on any side but one, it is worse shame to beg than to be on the worst side, were it worse than the name of rebellion can tell how to make it. You mistake me, sir. Why, sir, did I say you were an honest man? Setting my knighthood and my soldiership aside, I had lied in my throat if I had said so. I pray you, sir, then set your knighthood and our soldiership aside, and give me leave to tell you, you lie in your throat, if you may say I am any other than an honest man. I give thee leave to tell me so. I lay aside that which grows to me. If thou gettest any leave of me, hang me. If thou takest leave, thou wert better be hanged. You hunt counter. Hence, avon. Sir, my lord would speak with you. Sir John Falstaff, a word with you. My good lord, God give your lordship good time of day. I am glad to see your lordship abroad. I heard say your lordship was sick. I hope your lordship goes abroad by advice. Your lordship, though not clean past your youth, hath yet some smack of age in you, some relish of the saltness of time. And I must humbly beseech your lordship to have a reverent care of your health. Sir John, I sent for you before your execution to Shrewsbury. And to please your lordship, I hear his majesty has returned with some discomfort from Wales. I talk not of his majesty. You would not come when I sent for you. And I hear, moreover, his highness is fallen into the same horse on apoplexy. Well, God mend him, I pray you. Let me speak with you. This apoplexy is, as I take it, a kind of lethargy, and, and please your lordship, a kind of sleeping in the blood, a horse and tingling. Tell you me of it. it as it is. It hath its original for much grief from study and that perturbation of the brain. I have read the cause of his effect in Gallon. It's a kind of deafness. I think you are fallen into the disease, for you hear not what I say to you. <laughs> very well, my lord, very well. Rather, and please you, it is the disease of not listening, the malady of not marking, that I am troubled with all punish you by the heels, would amend the attention to your ears. I care not if I do become your physician. I am as poor as Job, my lord, but not so patient. Your lordship may minister the potion of imprisonment to me in respect of poverty, but how should I be your patient to follow your prescriptions? The wise may make some dram of a scruple, or indeed a scruple of itself. I sent for you when there were matters against you for your life to come speak with me. As I was then advised by my learned counsel in the laws of this land service, I did not come. Well, the truth is, Sir John, you live in great infamy. <laughs> he that buckles him in my belt cannot live in less. <laughs> your means are very slender and your waist is great. I would it were otherwise. I would my means were greater and my waist slenderer. <laughs> misled the young prince. The young prince hath misled me. I am the fellow with the great belly, and he my dog. I'm loath to gall a new healed wound. Your day's service at Shrewsbury hath a little gilded over your night's exploit on Gad's Hill. You may thank your unqui this unquiet time for your quiet or posting this action. Uh, my lord. But since all is well, keep it so. Wake not the sleeping wolf. Mm, to wake a wolf is as bad as to smell a fox. But you are as a candle, the better part burnt out. A wassail candle, my lord, all tallow. If I did say of wax, my growth would approve the truth. There is not a white hair on your face, but you should have his effect of gravity. His effect of gravy. Gravy, gravy. <laughs> you 
follow the young prince up and down like his ill angel. Not so, my lord. Your ill angel is light, but I hope he that looks upon me will take me without weighing. And yet in some respects, I grant, I cannot go. I cannot tell. Virtue is of so little regard in these customonger times that true valor has turned bear herd. Pregnancy has made a tapster and hath his quick wit wasted in given reckonings. All the other gifts are pertinent to man, as the malice of this age shapes them, are not worth a gooseberry. You that are old, consider not the capacities of us that are young. You do measure the heat of our livers with the bitterness of your galls, and we that are in the vower of our youth, I must confess, are wags too. You set down your name in the scroll of youth, that are withered down old with all the characters of age? Have you not a moist eye, a dry hand, a, a yellow cheek, a white beard, a decreasing leg, an increasing belly? Is not your voice broken, your wind short, your chin double, your wit single, and every part about you blasted with antiquity? And will you yet call yourself young? A fie, 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 Sir John. My lord, I was born about three of the clock in the afternoon with a white head and something around belly. For my voice, I've lost it with hallowing and singing of anthems. To approve my youth further, I will not. The truth is, I am only old in judgment and understanding. And he that will caper with me for a thousand marks, let him lend me the money and have at him. For the box of the ear that the prince gave you, he gave it like a rude prince, and you took it like a sensible lord. I have checked him for it, and the young lion repents. Married not in ashes and sackcloth, but a new silk and old sack. God send the prince a better companion. God send the companion a better prince. I rid my hands of him. Well, the king hath severed you and Prince Harry. I hear you are going with Lord John of Lancaster against the Archbishop and the Earl of Northumberland. Yea, I thank your pretty sweet wit for it. But look, you pray, all you that kiss my lady peace at home, that our armies join not in a hot day. For by the Lord, I take but two shirts out with me, and I mean not to sweat extraordinarily. If it be a hot day, and I brandish anything but a bottle, I would I might never spit white again. <laughs> There's not a dangerous action can peep out his head, but I am thrust upon it. Well, that cannot last ever. But it was always yet the trick of our English nation, if they have a good thing to make it too common. If you will need say I am an old man, you should give me rest. I would to God my name were not so terrible to the enemy as it is. I were better to be eaten to death with a rust than to be scoured to nothing with perpetual motion. Oh, be honest. Be honest, and God bless your expedition. Uh, will your lordship lend me a thousand pound to furnish me forth? Not a penny. Not a penny. You are too impertinent to bear crosses. Fare you well. Commend me to my cousin Westmoreland. If I do, fill it me with a three-man beetle. A man can no more separate age and covetousness than I can part a young limbs in lechery. But the gout galls the one and the pox pinches the other, and so both the degrees prevent my curses. Boy! Sir. What money is in my purse? Seven groats and two pence. Uh, I can no remedy against this consumption of the purse. Borrowing only lingers and lingers it out, but the disease is incurable. Uh, go bear this letter to my lord of Lancaster. This to the prince, this to the Earl of Westmoreland, and this to old Mistress Ursula, who I have weakly sworn to marry since I perceived the first white hair on my chin. About it, you know where to find me. Oh. Pox of this gout, or gout of this pox. But the one or the other plays the rogue with my great toe. Tis no matter if I do halt. I have the wars for my color, and my pension shall seem the more reasonable. As a good wit will make use of anything, I will turn diseases into commodity. Act One, Scene
Thus, <clears throat> thus have you heard our cause and known our means. And my most noble friends, I pray you all speak plainly your, your opinions of our hopes. First, Lord Marshall, what say you to it? Well, I well, uh, I well allow the occasion of our arms, but gladly would be better satisfied how in our means we should advance ourselves to look with forehead bold and big enough upon the power and puissance of the king. Our present masters grow upon the fire, the five and twenty thousand men of choice, and our supplies live largely in the hope of great Northumberland, whose bosom burns with the incensed fire of injuries. The question then, Lord Hastings, standeth thus, whether our present five and twenty thousand may hold up head without Northumberland. With him we may. Aye, Mary, there's the point. But if we, without him, we be thought too feeble, my judgment is we should not step too far till we had his assistance by the hand. For in a theme so bloody-faced as this, conjecture, expectation, and surmise of aids in certain should not be admitted. This is very true, Lord Bardolph, for indeed it was young Hotspur's case at Shrewsbury. It was, my lord, who lined himself with hope, eating the air on promise of supply, flattering himself with the project of a power much smaller than the smallest of his thoughts. And so, with great imagination, Robert de Madmin led his powers to death and winking leaped into destruction. But by your leave, I never, did, I never yet did hurt to lay down likelihoods and forms of hope. Yes, if this present quality of war, indeed the instant action, a cause on foot, lives so in hope as in an early spring we see the appearing buds, which to prove fruit, hope gives not so much warrant as despair that frosts will bite them. When we mean to build, we first survey the plot. Then draw the model, and when we see the figure of the house, then must we rate the cost of the erection, which if we find outweighs ability, what do we then but draw anew the model in fewer offices, or at least uh, desist to build at all? Much more in this great work, which is almost to pluck a kingdom down and set another up. Should we survey the plot of situation and the model? Consent upon a sure foundation? Question surveyors, know our own estate. How able such a work to undergo, to weigh against his opposite? Or else we fortify in paper and in figures, using the names of men instead of men, like one that draws the model of a house beyond his power to build it, who half through gives o'er and leaves his part created cost a naked subject to the weeping clouds and waste for churlish winter's tyranny. When the our hopes, ye likely of fair birth, should be stillborn, and that we now possess the utmost men of expectation, I think we are a body strong enough, even as we are, to equal with the king. What, uh, is, is the king but five and twenty thousand? To us, no more. Nay, not so much, Lord Badov. For his divisions, as the time do brawl, are in three heads, one power against the French, another against Glendower, before the third must take up us. So is the unfirm king is three divided, and his coffered sound with hollow poverty and emptiness. <clears throat> that he should draw his several strengths together and come against us in full puissance need not if be dreaded. So, if she should do so, he leave his back unarmed, the French and the Welsh Baying him at the heels. Never fear that. Who is it like should lead his forces hither? Oh, the Duke of Lancaster and Westmoreland against the Welsh, himself and Harry Monmouth. But who is substitute against the French? I have no certain choice. Let us on and publish the occasion of our arms. The Commonwealth is sick of their own choice. Their over greedy love hath surfeited. An habitation giddy and unsure has, hath he that buildeth on the vulgar heart. O oh, thou fond many, with what loud applause did thou beat heaven with blessing Bolingbroke before he was 
what thou wouldst have him be. And now, being trimmed in thine own desires, thou, beastly feeder, art so full of him that thou provokest thyself to cast him up. So thou common dog, didst thou disgorge thy glutton bosom of the royal Richard. And now thou wouldst eat thy dead vomit up, and house to find it. What trust is in these times? They that when Richard lived would have him die are now become enamored on his grave. Thou that threw dust upon his goodly head, when thou through proud London he came sighing on after the admired heels of Bolingbroke, criest now, O earth, yield us that king again, and take thou this. Uh, thoughts of men accursed, past to come seem best, things present worst. Yeah. Well, shall we go draw our numbers and set on? We're time subjects, and time is begun. Act two, scene one. Master Fang, have you entered the action? It is entered. Where's your yeoman? Is it a lusty yeoman? Will I stand to it? Sirrah, where's Snare? Oh, Lord, I, good Master Snare. Here, here. Snare, we must arrest Sir John Falstaff. Yes, good Master Snare, I have, I have entered him in all. It may chance cost some of us our lives, for he will stab. Alas, the day, take heed of him. He stabbed me in, in mine own house, and that most beastly. In good faith, he cares not what mischief he does. If his weapon be out, he will foin like any devil. He will spare neither man, woman, nor child. I can close with him. I care not for his thrust. No, nor I neither. I'll be at your elbow. And I but fist him once, and a come but within my vice. I am undone by his going. I, I warrant you, he's an infinitive thing upon my score. Good Master Fang, hold him sure. Good Master Snare, let him not scape. Uh, comes continually to Pie Corner, saving your manhoods, to buy a saddle. And he is indicted to dinner at the Lubber's Head in Lumber Street, to Master Smooth's the Silkman. I pray ye, since my exeunt is entered and my case so openly known to the world, let him be brought in to his answer. A hundred mark is a long one for a poor lone woman to bear, and I have borne and borne and borne and have been fubbed off and, and fubbed off and fubbed off from this day to that day, that it is a shame to be thought on. There is no honesty in such dealing unless a woman should be made an ass and a beast to bear every knave's wrong. Yonder he comes, and that errant Malmsey knows brave Bardolph with him. Do your offices, do your offices, Master Fang and Master Snare, do me, do me, do your offices. Oh now, whose mare's dead? What's the matter? Sir John, I arrest you at the suit of Mistress Quickly. Away, varlets! Draw off, Bardolph! Cut me off the villain's head! Throw that queen in the channel! Throw me in the channel? I'll throw thee in the channel! Wilt thou? Wilt thou? Thou bastardly rogue! Murder! Murder! Ow! Thou suckle villain! Thou wilt kill God's offices and the king's? Ah! Thou honeyseed rogue! Thou art a honeyseed, a man queller, and a woman queller! Eat them off, Bardolph! A rescue! A rescue! Good people, bring a rescuer too. Thou won't, won't thou? Thou won't, won't thou? Do, do thou rogue, do thou hemp seed. Away, you scullion, you rampallion, you fustilarian. I'll tickle your catastrophe. What's the matter? Keep the keys here, ho. Oh. Good my lord, be good to me. I beseech you, stand to me. And now, Sir John. What, are you brawling here? Let this become your place, your time in the business. You should have been well on your way to York. Stand from him, fellow. Therefore hangs thou upon him. Oh, most worshipful lord, 
and please your grace, I am a poor widow of cheese chap, and he is arrested at my suit. For what sum? It is more than for some, my lord. It is for all, all I have. He has eaten me out of house and home. He has put all my substance into that fat belly of his. But I will have some of it again, or I will ride thee on nights like the mare. I think I am as like to ride the mare if I have any vantage of ground to get up on. How come this, Sir John? Fie, what man of good temper would endure this tempest of exclamation? Are you not ashamed to enforce a poor widow to so rough a course to come at her own? What is the gross sum that I owe thee? Mary, if thou were an honest man, thyself and the money too, thou didst swear to be me upon a parcel gilt goblet sitting in my dolphin chamber at the round table by a sea coal fire upon Wednesday in Weeson Week, when the prince broke thy head for liking his father to a singing man of Windsor, thou didst swear to, to me then, as I was washing thy wound, to marry me and make me my lady thy wife. Canst thou deny it? Did not good wife Keach the, the butcher's wife come in then and call me gossip quickly? Coming in to borrow a mess of vinegar, telling us she had a good dish of prawns, whereby thou didst desire to eat some, whereby I told thee they were ill for a green wound? And didst thou not, when she was gone downstairs, desire to be no more familiarity with such poor people? saying that ere long they should call me madam? And didst thou not kiss me and bid thee fetch thee thirty shillings? I can put thee now to thy book oath. Deny it if thou canst. My lord, this is a poor mad soul. And she says up and down the town that the eldest son is like you. <gasps> he hath been in good case. And the truth is poverty hath distracted her. But for these foolish officers, I beseech you I may have redress against them. Sir John, Sir John, I am well acquainted with your manner of wrenching the true cause of the false way. It is not confident brow, nor the throng of words that come with such more than impudent sauciness from you can thrust me from the level of consideration. You have, as it appears to me, practiced upon the easy yielding spirit of this woman and made her serve your uses both in purse and in person. Yea, in truth, my lord. Pray thee peace. Pay her the debt you owe her and unhappy the villainy you have done her. One you may do with sterling money and the other with current repentance. My lord, I will not undergo this sneak without reply. You call honorable boldness impudent sauciness. If a man will make courtesy and say nothing, he is virtuous. No, my lord, my humble duty remembered, I will not be your suitor. I say to you, I do desire deliverance from these officers, being upon hasty employment in the king's affairs. You speak as having power to do wrong, but answer in the effect of your reputation and satisfy this poor woman. Come hither, hostess. Now, Master Gower, what news? The king, my lord, and Prince Harry of Wales are near at hand. The rest, paper tell. As I am a gentleman. Faith, you said so before. As I am a gentleman, come, no more words of it. By this heavenly ground I tread on, I must be fain to pawn both my plate and the tapestry of my dining chambers. Glasses. Glasses is the only drinking, and for thy walls, a pretty slight drollery, or the story of the prodigal, or the German hunting and waterwork, or is worth a thousand of these bed hangings and these fly-bitten tapestries. Let it be ten pound if thou canst. Come, and twere not for thy humors, there's no, not a better wench in England. Go, wash thy face and draw the action. Come, I must not be in this humor with me. Dost thou not know me? Come, 
Come, I know thou was set on to this. Pray thee, Sir John, let it be but twenty nobles. The faith I have looked upon my plate. So God save me, La. Let it alone. I'll make other shift. You'll be a fool still. Well, you shall have it, though I pawn my gown. I hope you'll come to supper. You'll pay me all together. Will I live? Go with her. With her. Hold on. Hold on. Will thou have Dal Tereshit meet you at supper? No more words. Let's have her. I have seen better news. What's the news, my lord? Where lay the king last night? At Bizingstoke, my lord. I hope, my lord, all's well. What is the news, my lord? Come all his forces back. Mm. No. 1,500 foot, 500 horse are marched up to my lord of Lancaster against Northumberland and the archbishop. Comes the king back from Wales, my noble lord. You shall have letters of me presently. Come, go along with me, good Master Gower. My lord. What's the matter? Master Gower, shall I entreat you with me to dinner? I must wait upon my good lord here. I thank you, good Sir John. Sir John, you loiter here too long, being you are to take soldiers up in the counties as you go. Will you sup with me, Master Gower? What foolish master taught you these manners, Sir John? Master Gower, if they become me not, he was a fool that taught them me. This is the right fencing grace, my lord. Tap for tap, and so part fair. Let the lord lighten thee. Thou art a great fool. Act two, scene two. Oh, before God, I am exceeding weary. It's come to that. I had thought weariness durst not have attached one of so high blood. Faith, it does me, though it discolors the complexion of my greatness to acknowledge it. Doth it not show vilely in me to desire small beer? Why, a prince should not be so loosely studied as to remember so weak a composition. Be like then my appetite was not princely got. For by my troth, I do now remember the poor creature's small beer. But indeed, these humble considerations make me out of love with my greatness. What a disgrace is it to me to remember thy name, or to know thy face tomorrow, or to take note how many pair of silk stockings thou hast, viz. these, and those that were thy peach-colored ones, or to bear the inventory of thy shirts, as one for superfluity and another for use, but that the tennis court keeper knows better than I, for it is a low ebb of linen with thee when thou keepest not racket there, as thou hast not done a great while, because the rest of thy low countries have made a shift to eat up thy Holland, and God knows whether those that ball out the ruins of thy linen shall inherit his kingdom. But the midwives say the children are not in the fault. Whereupon the world increases, and kindreds are mightily strengthened. How ill it follows, after you have labored so hard, you should talk so idly. Tell me, how many good young princes would do so, their fathers being sick as yours at this time is? Uh, shall I tell thee one thing, Point? Yes, faith, and let it be an excellent good thing. It shall serve among wits of no higher breeding than thine. Go to, I stand the push of your one thing that you will tell. <laughs> Mary, I'll tell thee. It is not meet that I should be sad, now my father is sick. Albeit I could tell thee, as to one it pleases me. For fault of a better to call my friend, I, I could be sad. And sad indeed, too. Very hardly upon such a subject. By this hand thou thinkest me as far in the devil's book as thou and Falstaff for obduracy and persistency. Let the end try the man. But I tell thee, my heart bleeds inwardly, that my father is so sick, and keeping such vile company as thou art, hath in reason taken from me all ostentation of sorrow. The reason? What wouldst thou think of me if I should weep? I would think thee a most princely hypocrite. It would be every man's thought. And thou art a blessed fellow to think as every man thinks. 
Never a man's thought in the world keeps the roadway better than thine. Every man would think me a hypocrite indeed. And what excites your most worshipful thought to think so? Why, because you've been so lewd and as much in graft to Falstaff. And to thee. By this light, I am well spoke on. I can hear it with my own ears. The worst that they can say of me is that I am a second brother and that I am a proper fellow of my hands. And those two things, I confess, I cannot help. By the mess, here comes Barnolf. Huh. And the boy that I gave Falstaff. I had him from me Christian. And look, if the fat villain have not transformed him ape. God save your grace. And yours, most noble Bardolf. Come, you virtuous ass, you bashful fool. Must you be blushing? Wherefore blush you now? What a maidenly man-at-arms are you become? Is such a matter to get a pottle's pot's maidenhead? He calls me even now, my lord, though through a red lattice, and I could discern no part of his face from the window. At last I spied his eyes, and methought he had made two holes in the alewife's new petticoat, and so peeped through. Has not the boy profited? Away, you horse on upright rabbit, away! <laughs> away, you rascally Alpheus dream, away! Oh, instruct us, boy. What dream, boy? Marry, my lord. Althea dreamed she was delivered of a firebrand, and therefore do I call him her dream. A crown's worth of good interpretation. <laughs> there it is, boy. Oh, that this good blossom could be kept from cankers. Well, there is a sixpence to preserve thee. And you do not make him hang it among you, the gallows shall have wrong. And how doth my master, Bardolph? Well, my lord, he heard of your graces coming to town. There's a letter for you. Delivered with good respect. And how doth the mortal mass, your master? In bodily health, sir. Mary, the immortal part needs a physician, but that moves him not, though that be sick, it dies not. I do allow this wen to be as familiar with me as my dog, and he holds his place, for look you how he writes. John Falstaff, knight, every man must know that as often as he has occasion to name himself, even like those that are king to the king, for they never prick their finger, but they say, there's some of the king's blood spilt. How comes that, says he, that takes upon him not to conceive? The answer is as ready as a borrower's cap. I am the king's poor cousin, sir. Nay, they will be king to us, or they will fetch it from Japheth. Uh, but to the letter. Sir John Falstaff, knight, to the son of the king, nearest his father, Harry, Prince of Wales, greeting. Why, this is a certificate. Peace. <laughs> I will imitate the honorable Romans in brevity. He sure means brevity and breath, short-winded. I commend thee, I commend me to thee, I commend thee and I leave thee. Be not too familiar with points, for he misuses thy favors too much. That he swears thou art to marry his sister Nell. Repent at idle times as thou mayest and so farewell. Thine by yea and no, which is as much to say as thou usest him, Jack Falstaff, with my familiars, John with my brothers and sisters, and Sir John with all Europe. My lord, I'll steep this letter in sack and make him eat it. Oh, that's to make him eat twenty of his words. But do you use me thus, Ned? Must I marry your sister? God send the wench no worse fortune, but I never said so. Well, thus we play the fools with the time, and the spirits of the wise sit in the clouds and mock us. Is your master here in London? Yea, my lord. Uh, where subsy? Doth the old boar feed in the old Frank? At the old place, my lord, in East Cheap. What company? A feast, my, my lord. lord, the old church. Sup any women with him? None, my lord, but old Mistress Quickly and Mistress Dull Tearsheet. What pagan may that be? A proper gentlewoman, sir, and a kinswoman of my master's. Oh, even such kin as the parish heifers are to the town bull. Shall we steal upon them, Ned, at supper? I am your shadow, my lord. I'll follow you. <laughs> Sir, uh, you boy and Bardolph, no word to your master that I am yet come to town. There's for your silence. I have no tongue, sir. And for mine, sir, I will govern it. Fare you well. Go. This dull tear sheet should be some road. I warrant you as common as the way between St. Albans and London. 
how might we see Falstaff bestow himself tonight in his true colors and not ourselves be seen? Put on two leathern jerkins and aprons and wait upon him at his table as drawers. From a god to a bull, a heavy dissension. It was Job's case. From a prince to apprentice, a low transformation. That shall be mine, for in everything the purpose must weigh with the folly. Follow me, Ned. Act two, scene three. I pray thee, loving wife and gentle daughter, give, give even way unto my rough affairs. Put now you on visage of the times, and be like them to Percy Troublesome. I have given over, I will speak no more. Do what you will, your wisdom be your guide. Alas, sweet wife, my honor is at pawn, and by my going, nothing can redeem it. Oh, yet for God's sake, go not to these wars. The time was, father, that you broke your word when you were more endeared to it than now. But your own Percy, when my heart's dear Harry through many a north would look to see his father bring up his powers. But he did long in vain. Who then persuaded you to stay at home? There were two honors lost, yours and your son's. For yours, the God of heaven brighten it. For his? It stuck upon him as the sun in the gray vault of heaven. And by his light did all the chivalry of England move to do brave acts. He was indeed the glass wherein the noble youth to dress themselves. He had no legs to practice not his gait. And speaking thick, which nature made his blemish, became the accents of the valiant. For those that could speak low and heartily would turn their own perfection to abuse to seem like him. So that in speech, in gait, in diet, in affections of delight, in military rules, humors of blood, he was the mark and glass, copy and book that fashioned others. And him, oh wondrous him, oh miracle of men. Him did you leave, second to none, unseconded by you, to look upon the hideous god of war in disadvantage, to abide a field where nothing but the sound of Hotspur's name did seem defensible. So you left him. Never. Oh, never do his ghost the wrong to hold your honor more precise and nice with others than with him. Let them alone. The marshal and the archbishop are strong. Had my sweet Harry and but half their numbers, today might I, hanging upon Hotspur's neck, have talked of Monmouth's grave. Be sure your heart, fair daughter, you do draw my spirits from me with new lamenting Asian oversights. But I must go and meet with danger there, or it will seek me another place and find me worse provided. Oh, fly to Scotland, till that the nobles and the armored commons have of their puissance made a little taste. If they get ground and vantage of the king, and join you with them, like a rib of steel to make strength stronger, but for all our loves, first let them try themselves. So did your son, he was so suffered. So came I a widow, and never shall have length of life enough to rain upon remembrance with mine eyes that it may grow and sprout as high as heaven for recordation of my noble husband. Come, come, go in with me. It's with my mind, and with the tie swelled up unto his height, 
that makes a stool stand running neither way. Think would I go to meet the Archbishop? A many thousand reasons hold me back. I will resolve for Scotland. There am I, though time and vantage crave my company. Act two, scene four. What the devil hast thou brought there? Apple John's? Thou knowest Sir John cannot endure an Apple John. Mass, thou sayest true. The prince once set a dish of Apple John's before him and told him there were five more Sir John's and putting off his hat said, I will now take my leave of these six dry round old withered knights. It angered him to the heart, but he hath forgot that. Why then cover and set them down and see if thou cannot find out, find out Sneak's nose. Noise, Mistress Tearsheet would fa fain hear some music. Dispatch, the room where they supped is too hot, will come in straight. Sirrah, here will be the prince and master Poins anon, and they will put on two of our jerkins and aprons, and Sir John must not know of it. Ardolf hath brought word. By the mass, he will be old Eudas. It will be an excellent strategium. I'll see if I can find out sneak. Faith, sweetheart, methinks now you are an excellent good temper temporality. Your pulsage beats as extraordinarily as heart would desire, and your color, I warrant you, is as red as any rose in good truth law, but in faith, you have drunk too much canaries, and that's a marvelous searching wine, and it perfumes the blood, ere one can say, what's this? How do you know? Better than I was. <laughs> Why, that's well said. A good heart's worth gold. Lo, here comes Sir John. When Arthur first in court emptied the Jordan and was a worthy king, how now, Mistress Dahl? Sick of a calm, yea, good faith. So is all her sect. And they be once in a calm, they're sick. <laughs> you muddy rascal. Is that all the comfort you can give me? You make fat rascals, Mr. Stahl. I make them. Gluttony and diseases make them. I make them not. If the cook helped to make the gluttony, you help to make the diseases, doll. We catch of you, doll. We catch of you. Grant that, my poor virtue. Grant that. Yea, joy, our chains and our jewels. Ah, uh, your brooches, pearls, and ouches. For to serve bravely is to come halting off, you know. To come off the breach with his pipe bent bravely, and to surgery bravely, to venture upon the charged chambers bravely. <laughs> hang yourself, you muddy conger, hang yourself. By my troth, this is the old fashion. You two never meet, but you fall to some discord. You were both. In good faith, as rheumatic as two dry toasts, you cannot bear one with one another's confirmities. What the good year one must bear, and that must be you. You are the weaker vessel, as they say, the emptier vessel. <laughs> Can a weak, empty vessel bear such a huge, full hogshead? There's a whole merchant's venture of Bordeaux stuff in him. You've not seen a hog better stuff in the hole. Come, I'll be friends with thee, Jack. Thou art going to the wars, and whether I shall ever see thee again or no, there is nobody cares. Sir, Agent Pistol's below, and we'll speak with you. Oh, hang him, swaggering rascal. Let him not come hither, is the foul mouth disrogue in England. If he swagger, let him not come here. No, by my faith, I must live among my neighbors. I'll know swaggerers. I am in good name and fame with the very best. Shut the door. There comes no swaggerers here. I have not lived all this while to have swaggering now. Shut the door, I pray you. Dost thou hear, hostess? Pray ye pacify yourself, Sir John. There comes no swaggerers here. 
Dost thou hear? It is mine ancient. Tilly fally, Sir John, ne'er tell me. Your ancient swagger comes not in my doors. I was before Master Tissick, the deputy, t'other day, and as he said to me, "'Twas no longer the go than Wednesday last, I, good faith, neighbor quickly, says he, Master Dumb, our minister was by then, neighbor quickly, says he, receive those that are civil, for, said he, you are in an ill name. Now, I said so, I can tell whereupon for, says he, you are an honest woman and well thought on. Therefore, take heed what guest you receive. Receive, says he, no swaggering companions. There comes none here. You would bless you to hear what he said. No, I'll no swaggerers. He's no swaggerer, hostess. A tame cheater, if faith. You may stroke him as gently as a puppy greyhound. He'll not swagger with a Barbary hen if, you're, if her feathers turn back on any show of resistance. Call him up, drawer. Cheater, call you him? I will bar no honest man in my house, nor no cheater. But I do not love swaggering. By my troth, I am the worse when one says swagger. Feel, feel, masters, how I shake. Look you, I warrant you. So you do, hostess. Do I? Yea, in very faith do I. And tore an aspen leaf, I cannot abide swaggerers. God save you, Sir John. Welcome, ancient pistol. Here, pistol, I charge you with a cup of sack. Do you discharge upon mine hostess? I will discharge upon her, John, with two bullets. Um, she is pistol-proof, sir. You shall hardly offend her. Come, I'll drink no proofs nor bullets. I'll drink more than will do me good. For no man's pleasure, I. Then, to you, Mistress Dorothy, I will charge you. Charge me? I scorn you, scurvy companion. What, you poor, base, rascally, cheating, lacklinin mate. Away, you mouldy rogue, away. I am meat for your master. I know you, Mistress Dorothy. Away, you cut-purse rascal. You filthy bung away. By this wine, I'll thrust my knife in your mouldy chaps and you play the saucy cuttle with me. Away, you bottle ale rascal, you Basket hilt stale juggler, you. When, I pray you, sir, God's light with two points in your shoulder, much. God, let me not live, but I will murder your wrath for this. No more, Pistol. I would not have you go off here. Discharge yourself out of our company, Pistol. No, good Captain Pistol, not here, sweet Captain. Captain! Thou abominable damned cheater, art thou not ashamed to be called captain? And captains were of my mind, they were trunching you out for taking their names upon you before you have earned them. You captain! Huh? You slave for what? For tearing a poor whore's rough in a boardy house? Here, captain. Hang him, rogue. He lives upon mouldy stewed prunes and dried cakes, a captain. God's light, like, these villains will make the world as odious as the word occupy, which was an excellent good word before it was ill-sorted. Therefore, Captain had need look to it. Pray thee go down, good ancient. Hark thee hither, Mr. Stahl. Not, I tell ye what, Corporal Baldoff, I could tear her. I'll be revenged of her. Pray thee go down. <laughs> I'll see her damned at first. To Pluto's damned at lake, by this hand, to the infernal deep with Erebus and tortures vile also. Hook, hold, and line, say I. Down, down, dogs. Down, Vators. Have we not Hyron here? Good, Captain Peasel, be quiet. Tis very late. A faith, I beseech you now. Aggravate your choler. <laughs> These be good humors, indeed shall pack horses and hollow pampered jades of Asia, which cannot go but thirty mile a day, compare with Caesars and with cannibals and Trojan Greeks. Nay, rather damn them with King Cerberus and let the welkin roar. 
Shall we fall foul for toys? By my troth, Captain, those are very bitter words. Be gone, good ancient. This will grow to a brawl anon. Die, men like dogs. Give crowns like pins. Have we not heron here? Oh, my word, Captain, there's none such here. What the good year? Do you think I would deny her? For God's sake, be quiet. And feed and be fat, my Calipolis. Come, give some sack. Ti fortune mi tormente separato mi contento. Fear we brought signs, no. Let the fiend give fire. Give me some sack, sweetheart, and lie thou there. Come we to full points here, and are it said is nothing. Pistol, I would be quiet. <laughs> Sweet night, I kiss thy knees. What? Have we seen the seven stars? For God's sake, thrust him downstairs. I cannot endure such a Faustian rascal. Thrust him downstairs. No, we not Galloway nags. Quite him down, Bardolph, like a shove groat shilling. Nay, and uh, do nothing but speak nothing. I shall be nothing here. Come, get you downstairs. What shall we have incision? Shall we embrew? <sighs> then death rock me asleep. A bridge, my doleful days. Why then, let grievous, ghastly, gaping wounds untwine the sisters three? Come, Atropus, I say. Here's goodly stuff toward. Give me my rapier, boy. I pray thee, Jack, I pray thee, do not draw. Get you downstairs. Here's a goodly tumult. I'll forswear keeping house, afore I'll be in this turrets and frights. So, murder I warrant now. Alas, alas, put up your naked weapons. Put up your naked weapons. I pray thee, Jack, be quiet. The rascal's gone, you horse and little valiant villain, you. Do you not hurt in the groin? Methought I've made a shrewd thrust at your belly. Have you turned him out of doors? Yea, sir, the rascal's drunk. You have hurt him, sir, in the shoulder. A rascal, to brave me. <laughs> you sweet little rogue, you. Alas, poor ape, how thou sweatest. Let me wipe thy face. Come on. Your horse and chops. Oh, rogue. If faith, I love thee. Thou art as valorous as Hector of Troy, worth five of Agamemnon and ten times better than the nine worthies of villain. A rascally slave. I will toss the rogue in a blanket. <laughs> Do, and thou darest for thy heart, and thou dost, I'll canvas thee between a pair of sheets. Music has come, sir. I will let them play. Play, sirs. Sit on my knee, doll. A rascal bragging slave, the rogue fled from me like quicksilver. If faith, and thou followedest him like a church. Thou horse and little tidy Bartholomew boar pig. When wilt thou leave fighting a days and foining a nights and begin to patch up thine old body for heaven? Peace, good doll. Do not speak like a death's head. Do not bid me remember mine end. Sirrah, what humours the prince of? A good, shallow young fellow. I would have made a good paddler. I would he a chip bread well. They say Poins has a good wit. <laughs> he a good wit. Hang him, baboon. His wit's as thick as Tewkesbury mustard. There's no more conceit in him than there is in a mallet. Why does the prince love him so, then? Because their legs are both of a bigness, and a plays at quoits well and eats conger and fennel, and drinks off candles' ends for flap dragons, and rides the wild mare with the boys, and jumps upon joint stools, and swears with a good grace, and wears his boots very smooth, like unto the sign of the leg, and breeds no bait with telling of discreet stories, and such other gamble faculties as, that show a weak mind and an able body, for the which the prince admits him, for the prince himself is such another. The weight of a hair will turn the scales between their avoirdupois. Would not this knave of a wheel have his ears cut off? Let's beat him before his whore. 
Look, whether the withered elder hath not his pole clawed like a parrot. Is it not strange that desire should so many years outlive performance? Kiss me, doll. Saturn and Venus, this year in conjunction. <laughs> what says the almanac to that? And look, whether the fiery dragon, his man, be not lisping to his master's old tables, his notebook, his council keeper. Thou dost give me flattering buses. I, my troth, I kiss thee with a most constant heart. No, I am old. I am old. I love thee better than I love e'er scurvy young boy of them all. What stuff we'll have a curdle of. I shall receive money a Thursday. Shall have a cap tomorrow. A merry song. Come, girls late. Go to bed. Thou forget me when I am gone. By my troth, thou set me a weeping. And thou sayest so. Prove that ever I dress myself handsome till there I return, I'll hearken at the end. Some sack, Francis. Anon. Anon, sir. <laughs> a bastard son of the king's. And art not thou pawns his brother? Why, thou globe of sinful continents, what a life dost thou lead? A uh, better than thou. I am a gentleman, thou art a drawer. Very true, sir, and I come to draw you out by the ears. Oh, the Lord preserve thy good grace by my troth. Welcome to London. Now the good Lord bless with sweet face of thine. Oh, Jesu, are you come from Wales? Thou horse on mad compound of majesty. By this light flesh and corrupt blood thou art welcome. Oh, you fat fool, I scorn you. My lord, he will drive you out of your revenge and turn all to merriment if you do not take the heat. You horse and candle mine. You, how vilely did you speak of me even now before this honest, virtuous, civil gentlewoman. <laughs> by God's blessing of your good heart. Oh, and so she is by my trial. Didst thou hear me? Yea, and you knew me as you did when you ran away by Gad's Hill. You knew I was at your back and spoke it on purpose to try my patience. No, 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 not so. I did not think thou wast within hearing. Oh, I shall drive you then to conf confess the willful abuse, and then I know how to handle you. No abuse, Hal, of mine honor, no abuse. Not to dispraise me and call me pantsier and, and, and bread chipper and I know not what? No abuse, Hal. No abuse? No abuse, Ned, in the world, honest Ned, none. I just praised him before the wicked, that the wicked might not fall in love with him, in which doing I have done the part of a careful friend and a true subject, and thy father is to give me thanks for it. No abuse, Hal. None, Ned, none. No, faith, boys, none. Me now whether pure fear and entire cowardice doth not make thee wrong this virtuous gentlewoman to close with us. Is she of the wicked? Is thine hostess here of the wicked? Or is thy boy of the wicked? <laughs> or honest Bardolph, whose zeal burns in his nose of the wicked? Answer, thou dead elm, answer. The fiend hath pricked down Bardolph irrecoverable and his face is Lucifer's privy kitchen, where he doth nothing but roast malt worms. For the boy, there is a good angel about him, but the devil outbids him too. <laughs> For the women? For one of them, she is in hell already and burns poor souls. For the other, I owe her money, and whether she be damned for that, I know not. No, I warned you. No. I think thou art not. I think thou art quit for that. Mary, there is another indictment upon thee for suffering flesh to be eaten in thy house, contrary to the law for the which I think thou wilt howl. All victuallers do so. What's a joint of mutton or two in a whole Lent? You, gentlewoman. What says your grace? His grace says that which his flesh rebels against. Who knocks so loud at door? Look, look to the door there. Francis! Uh, Petto, how now? What news? The king, your father, is at Westminster, and there are twenty weak and weary posts. Come from the north, and I, as I came along. 
I met and overtook a dozen captains, bareheaded, sweating, knocking at the taverns, and asking every one for Sir John Falstaff. By heaven, points, I feel me much to blame. So idly to profane the precious time when tempest of commotion like the south born with black vapor doth begin to melt and drop upon our bare unarmed heads. <sighs> Give me my sword and cloak. Falstaff, good night. Now comes the sweetest morsel of the night, and we must hence and leave it unpicked. More knocking at the door. How now? What's the matter? You must await a court, sir. Presently, a dozen captains stay at door for you. Hey, the musicians, sirrah. Um, farewell, hostess. Farewell, doll. You see, my good wenches, how men of merit are sought after. The underserver may sleep when the man of action is called on. Farewell, good wenches. If I be not sent away post, I will see you again ere I go. I cannot speak. If my heart be not red to burst, well, sweet Jack, have a care of thyself. Farewell. Farewell. Well, well, fare thee well. I have known thee these 29 years come Peascod time, but an honester and true hearted man. Well, fare thee well. Mistress Tearsheet. What's Mistress the matter? Tearsheet. What's Mistress, the matter? Would Mistress Tearsheet come to my master? Oh, run doll, run, run, good doll. Come, she comes blubbered. Yay, will you come, doll? Act three, scene one. Go call the earls of Surrey and of Warwick, but ere they come, bid them or read these letters and well consider of them, make good speed. How many thousand of my poorest subjects are at this hour asleep? Oh, sleep, oh, gentle sleep. Nature's soft nurse, how I have frighted thee, that thou no more wilt weigh my eyelids down and steep my senses in forgetfulness. Why rather sleep liest thou in smoky cribs, upon uneasy pallets stretching thee, and hushed with buzzing night flies to thy slumber than in the perfumed chambers of the great, under the canopies of costly state, and lulled with sound of sweetest melody. O oh, thou dull god, why liest thou with the vile in loathsome beds, and leavest the kingly couch a watch case or a common alarm bell? Wilt thou upon the high and giddy mast seal up the ship boy's eyes and rock his brains, in cradle of the rude imperious surge and in the visitation of the winds who take the ruffian billows by the top, curling their monstrous heads and hanging them with deafening clamor in the slippery clouds that with the hurly death itself awakes? Canst thou, O oh, partial sleep, give thy repose to the wet sea boy in an hour so rude and in the calmest and most stillest night? with all appliances and means to boot, deny it to a king? Then happy low, lie down. Uneasy lies the head that wears a crown. Many good morrows to your majesty. Is it good morrow, lords? T Tis one o'clock and fast. Why then, good morrow to you all, my lords. Have you read over the letters that I sent you? We have, my liege. Then you perceive the body of our kingdom, how foul it is, what rank diseases grow, and with what danger near the heart of it. It is but as a body yet distempered, which to his former strength may be restored with good advice and little medicine. My lord Northumberland will soon be cool. Oh, God, that one might read the book of fate and see the revolution of the times, make mountains level in the continent, weary of solid firmness, melt itself into the sea and other times to see, 
the beachy girdle of the ocean, too wide for Neptune's hips, how chances mock and changes fill a cup of alteration with divers, liquors, oh, if this were seen. The happiest youth viewing his progress through what perils past, what crosses to ensue, would shut the book and sit him down and die. Tis not 10 years gone since Richard and Northumberland, great friends that feast together. And in two years after were they at wars. It is but eight years since. This Percy was the man nearest my soul, who like a brother toiled in my affairs and laid his love and life under my foot. Yea, for my sake, even to the eyes of Richard, gave him defiance. But which of you was by? You, cousin Neville, as I may remember, when Richard, with his eye brimful of tears, then checked and rated by Northumberland, did speak these words, now proved a prophecy? Northumberland, thou ladder by the witch, my cousin Bolingbroke ascends my throne. Though then, God knows I had no such intent. But that necessity so bowed the state that I and greatness were compelled to kiss. The time shall come, thus did he follow it. The time will come, that foul sin gathering head shall break into corruption so went on, foretelling this same time's condition and the division of our amity. There is a history in all men's lives figuring the nature of the times deceased. The witch observed, a man may prophesy with a near aim of a, the main chance of things as yet not come to life, which in their seeds and weak beginnings lie in treasure. Which things become the hatch and brood of time. And by the necessary form of this, King Richard might create a perfect guest that great Northumberland, then false to him, would of that seed grow to a greater falseness, which should not find a ground to root upon unless on you. Are these things then necessities? Then let us meet them like necessities. And that same word even now cries out on us. They say the bishop and Northumberland are 50,000 strong. It cannot be, my lord. Rumor doth double, like the voice and echo, the numbers of the feared. Please it your grace to go to bed. Upon my soul, my lord, the powers that you already have sent forth shall bring this prize in very easily. Comfort you the more, I have received a certain instance that Glendower is dead. Majesty hath been this fortnight ill, and these unseasoned hours perforce must add unto your sickness. I will take your counsel. And were these inward wars once out of hand, we would, dear lords, unto the Holy Land. Act three, scene two. Come on, come on, come on, sir, give me your hand, sir, give me your hand, sir, an early stir by the road. <laughs> How doth my good cousin silence? Good morrow, good cousin Shallow. And how doth my cousin, uh, your, your bedfellow, and your fairest daughter, and mine, my goddaughter, Ellen? Alas, a black owl, cousin Shallow. Ah, uh, by a nay, sir, I dare say my cousin William is become a good scholar. He is at Oxford still, is he not? Indeed, sir, to my cost. Ah. Uh, must then to the inns of court, Charlie. I, I was once of Clement's Inn, where I think they will talk of mad shallow yet. You were called lusty shallow then, cousin. By the mass, I was called anything. <laughs> and I would have done anything indeed to, oh, and roundly too. There, there was I and, and little John Doit of, of Staffordshire and Black George. Barnes and Francis Pitbone and Will Square, a Cotswold man. You, you had not four such swing bucklers in all of the inns of court again. Oh, and I must say to you, uh, we, we knew where the Bona Robos were and had the best of them all at commandments. And there was Jack Falstaff, now Sir John, a boy, a page to Thomas Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk. This, Sir John, cousin, that comes hither anon about soldiers? 
Mm-hmm. Well, the, the same Sir John, the very same, yes. Uh, I, I see him break uh, Scogan's head at the court gate when, when I was uh, a crack not thus high. And the very same day did I fight with one Samson, the stockfish and, and fruit air, uh, behind, behind Gray's Inn. Jesu, 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 the mad days that I have spent <laughs> to see, just to see how many of my old acquaintances are dead. We shall all follow, cousin. Yeah, to a certain very sure, very sure death, as the psalmist saith, is certain to all. All shall die. How a good yoke of bollocks at Stamford Fair, eh? Uh, by my troth, I was not there. Oh, uh, uh, death is certain. Uh, sorry, silence. Uh, is old double of your of your town living yet? Dead, sir. Oh, Jesu, Jesu, dead. Hmm. Well, I drew a good bow and dead, um, and shot a fine shoot. John, a gaunt, loved him well and betted much money on his head. Dead, hmm. I would have clapped. <laughs> Here, the cloud had twelve. Sc- Go and carried you a forehand shaft of fourteen and fourteen and, and a half. That, that would have done a man, man's heart good to see. Uh, how a score of yous now? Thereafter as they be, a score of good yous may be worth ten pounds. <gasps> and is all double dead. Here come of two of Sir John Falstaff's men, as I think. Good morrow, honest gentlemen. I beseech thee. Which is just as shallow? Well, I, 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 I am Robert Shallow, sir, a poor esquire of this county and one of the king's justices of, of the peace. What, what is your good pleasure with me? My captain, sir, commends him to you. My captain, Sir John Falstaff, a tall gentleman by heaven and a most gallant leader. Oh, he greets me well, sir. I knew him, a good uh, backsward man. How out of the good... Good night. May I may I ask how my lady, his wife, doth? Sir, pardon. A soldier is better accommodated than with a wife. Oh, it is well said in face, sir, and it is well said indeed, too. <laughs> well, better accommodated. It is good, yea, indeed. It, is it? Good phrases are surely and ever were very commendable. Accommodated? Yes, it comes of a commodore. Very good. Good phrase. Pardon me, sir, I have heard the word. Phrase call you it? By this good day, I know not the phrase, but I will maintain the word with my sword to be a soldier-like word and a word of exceeding good command by heaven. Accommodated. That is, when a man is, as they say, accommodated, or when a man is being whereby a may be thought to be accommodated, Um, which is an excellent thing. Oh, it is very just. (laughs) Oh, look, look, here, here, come, here comes good Sir John. Uh, give me your good hand. Give me your, your worship's good hand. By, by my troth, you like well and bear your ears very well. Welcome, welcome, good Sir John. I am glad to see you well, good Master Robert Shallow. Uh, mm. Master Surecard, as I think. No, Sir John, it is my cousin Silence in commission with me. Good Master Silence. Well, the fits you should be of the peace. Your good worship is welcome. It says hot weather, gentlemen. Have you provided me here half a dozen sufficient men? Mary, have we, sir? Will, will you sit? Uh, let me see them, I beseech you. Well, where's the roll? Where's the roll? Where's the roll? Let me see, let me see, let me see. So, 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 so. Yes, Mary, sir. Ralph Moldy, let them appear as I call. Let them do so. Let them do so. Let them see. Let me see. Where is Moldy? Moldy? Here, and it please you. Oh, well, 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 thank you, Sir John. A good limbed fellow, young, strong, and of good friends. Hmm. Is thy name Moldy? Yea, and it please you. Tis the more time thou wert used. Oh. <laughs> Most excellent, yeah. In faith, things, things that are moldy lack use. Yeah, well, very singular good in faith. Well said, Sir John, very well said. Prick him. Uh, I was pricked well enough before, and you could have me, let me alone. 
the dame will be undone now for one to do her husbandry and her drudgery. You need not have pricked me. There are other men fitter to go out than I. Go to. Peace, Moldy. You shall go. Moldy, it's time you were spent. Spent? Yeah, but peace, fellow. Peace. Stand aside. Oh, know you where you are for the other. So, John, let me see. Uh, Simon Shadow. Yeah, Mary. Let us let me have him to sit under. It's like to be a bold soldier. Where, Shadow? Here, sir. Shadow, whose son art thou? Uh, uh, my mother's son, sir. Thy mother's son. Like enough in thy father's shadow. So the son of the female is the shadow of the male. It is uh, often so, indeed. But much of the father's substance. And what, do you like him, Sir John? Shadow will serve for summer. Prick him. For we have a number of shadows to fill up the mustard book. Uh, Thomas Ward! Where's he? Here, what? sir. Is thy name Wart? Yea, sir. Thou art a very ragged wart. Shall I prick him down, Sir John? It were superfluous, for his apparel is built upon his back. Mm. The whole frame stands upon pins. Mm. Prick him no more. <laughs> ha, 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 ha. You can do it, sir. You can do it. I commend you well. Balance this feeble. Here, sir. Fe what trade art thou, Feeble? A woman's tailor, sir. Shall I prick him, sir? You may, but if he had been a man's tailor, he'd have pricked you. Oh. Wilt thou make as many holes in an enemy's battle as thou hast done in a woman's petticoat? I do my good will, sir. You can have no more. Well said, good woman's tailor. Well said, courageous, Feeble. Thou wilt be as valiant as the wrathful dove for most Magnanimous mouse, prick the woman's tailor. Well, Master Shadow, deep, Master Shadow. A wart might have gone, sir. I would thou wert a man's tailor, that thou mightst mend him and make him fit to go. I cannot put him to a private soldier that is the leader of so many thousands. Let that suffice, most forcible feeble. It shall suffice, sir. I am bound to thee, Reverend Feeble. Who is next? Peter Bullcalf for the green. Hey, Mary, let's see Bullcalf. Yes, sir. For God, a likely fellow. Come, prick me, Bullcalf, till he roar again. Oh, Lord, good, my Lord Captain. Uh, what dost thou roar before thou art pricked? Oh, Lord, sir, I am a diseased man. What disease hast thou? A horse and cold, sir. <coughs> A cough, sir, which I caught with ringing in the king's affairs upon his coronation day. Sir. Come, thou shalt go to the wars in a gown. We will have away thy cold, and I will take such order that my friends shall ring for thee. Uh, is here all? Here's two more called than your number. You must have but four here, sir. And so I pray you, go in with me to dinner. Oh, come, I will go drink with you, but I cannot tarry dinner. I'm glad to see you by my troth, Mr. Shallow. Oh, Sir John, do you remember since we lay all night in the windmill in, uh, in St. George Field? Hmm? No more of that, good Master Shallow, no more of that. Hmm. Well, it was a merry night. And is Jane Nightwork alive? She lives, Master Shallow. Well, she never could away with me. Never, never. She would always say she could not abide, Master Shallow. Oh, by the mass, I could anger her to the heart. Oh, she was then a bone of robe. Uh, does she hold her own well? Old, old, Master Shallow. Nay, she must be old. She cannot choose but be old. Certain she's old. <laughs> and had Robin Nightwork by old Nightwork before I came to Cement's Inn? Clement's Inn? That's 55 year ago. Ah! Cousin Silence! That thou hast seen it, that th this night and I've seen. Oh, Sir John's said I will. <laughs> we have heard the chimes at midnight, Master Shallow. Oh, that we have, that we have, that we have, yes, in faith. Oh, Sir John, 
We have. Well, our watchword was hem boys. Mm -hmm. Come, let's to dinner. Come, let's to dinner. Jesus, the days that we have seen. Come, come. Good Master Corporate Bardolf, stand my friend. And here's four Harry Ten Shillings in French crowns for you. Very true, sir. I had his leaf be hanged, sir, as though. And yet, for my own part, sir, I do not care. But rather, because I'm unwilling, and for my own part, have a desire to stay with my friends. Else, sir, I did not care for my own part so much. Go to, stand aside. And good master, corporal captain, my old dame's sake, stand my friend. She has nobody to do anything about her when I'm gone, and she is old and cannot help herself. You shall have forty, sir. Go to, stand aside. And my troth, I care not. A man can die but once. We all God to death. I'll never bear a base mind. And it be my destiny so, and it be not so. No man's too good to serve, to serve his prince, and let it go which way it will. He that dies this year is quit for the next. Well said. Thou art a good fellow. Faith, I'll bear no base mind. Come, sir. Uh, which men shall I have? Um, uh, four, would you please? Sir, a word with you. I have three pound to free Moldy and Bullcalf. Go to. Well. I'm sorry, John. Which four will you have? Uh, do you choose for me? Well, Mary, then. Moldy, Bullcalf, Feeble, and Shadow. Moldy and Bullcalf. Uh, for you, Moldy, stay at home to your past service. Mm. And for your part, Bullcalf, Grow till you come unto it. I will none of you. Oh, Sir John, Sir John, do not yourself wrong. They, they are your likeliest men, and I, I, I would have you served with the best. Will you tell me, Master Shallow, how to choose a man? Oh. Care I for the limb, the thews, the stature, bulk, and big semblance of a man? Give me the spirit, Master Shallow. Here's wart. You see what a ragged appearance it is. Mm. I shall charge you and discharge you with the motion of a pewterer's hammer. Come off and on swifter than he that gibbets on the brewer's bucket. And this same half-faced fellow of uh, shadow, give me this man. He presents no mark to the enemy. The foeman may with his great aim level at the edge of a penknife. And for the, a retreat, how swiftly will this feeble, the woman's tailor, run off? <laughs> Give me the spare men and spare me the great ones. Put me a clavier into Wart's hand, Bardolf. Hold, Wart, traverse. Thus, thus, thus. Come, manage me your clavier. So, very well. Go to, very good. Exceeding good. Uh, give me always a little lean, old, chapped, bald shot. Huh? Well said, a faith. Uh, Wart. Thou art a good scab. Hold. There's a tester for thee. Hmm. Well, he is, he is not his craft's master. He doth not do it right. I remember at Mill and Green, when I lay at Clement's Inn, I was then Sir Dagonet in Arthur's show. There was a little quiver fellow, and I would manage you his piece thus, and I would uh, about and about, and come you in, and come you in, and ra ta 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 would have say, bounce, would have say, and away again would have go, and again would have come, and shall now see such a fellow. These fellows will do well, Master oh. Shadow. God keep you, Master Silence. I will not use many words with you. Mm. Very well, gentlemen, both. I thank you. I must a dozen mile tonight. Bardolf, give the soldiers coats. Sir John, the Lord bless you. God prosper your affairs. God send us peace. At your return, visit our house. Let our acquaintances be renewed. Pre-adventure, I will with thee to court. For God, I, I would you would, Master Shallow. 
go to, I have spoke at a word, God keep you. Very well, gentlemen, gentle gentlemen. On, Bardolph, lead the men away. As I return, I will fetch off these justices. I do see the bottom of justice shallow. Lord, Lord, how subject we old men are to this vice of lying. The same star of justice hath done nothing but prate to me of the wildness of his youth, and the feats he hath done about Turnbull Street. And every third word a lie, a doer paid to the hearer than the Turk's tribute. I do remember him at Clement's Inn, like a man made after supper of a cheese pairing. When I was naked, he was, for all the world, like a forked radish, with a head fantastically carved upon it with a knife. It was so forlorn that his dimensions to any thick sight were invincible. It was the very genius of famine, yet lecherous as a monkey. And the whores called him a mandrake. I came ever in the rearward of the fashion and sung those tunes to the overscutch huswives that he heard the carmen whistle and swear they were his fancies or his good nights. And now is this vice's dagger become a squire and talks as familiarly of John Agaunt as if he had been sworn brother to him. And I'll be sworn, I never saw him but once in the tilt yard. And then he burst his head for crowding among the marshal's men. I saw it and told John Agaunt he beat his own name for you might have thrust him in all his apparel into an eel skin. The case of a treble hot boy was a mansion for him. A court. And now he has land and beefs. Oh, I'll be acquainted with him. If I return, that shall go hard, but I will make him a philosopher's two stones to me. If the young dace be a bait for the old pike, I see no reason in the law of nature, but I may snap at him. A time shape. And there's an end. Act four, scene one. What is this forest called? It is Gong Tree Forest, as shall please your grace. Here stand, my lords, and send discoverers forth to know the numbers of our enemies. Uh, we have sent forth already. Tis well done. My friends and brethren, brethren in these great affairs, must acquaint you that I've received new dated letters from Northumberland. Their cold intent, tenor and substance thus. Here doth he wish his person with such powers as might hold sortance with his quality, the which he could not levy, whereupon he is retired to ripe his growing fortunes to Scotland and concludes in hearty prayers that your attempts may overlive the hazard and fearful melting of their opposite. Thus do the hopes we have in him touch ground and dash themselves to pieces. Now what news? Speak for us. West of this forest, scarcely off a mile, in goodly form comes on the enemy, and by the ground they hide. I judge their numbers upon or near the rate of 30,000. Oh, the just proportion that we gave them out, let us sway on and face them in the field. What well-appointed leader fronts us here? I think it is my lord of Westmoreland. Health and fair greeting from our general, the prince, Lord John and Duke of Lancaster. Say on, my lord of Westmoreland, in peace. What doth concern your coming? Then, my lord, unto your grace do I in chief address the substance of my speech. If that rebellion came like itself, in base and abject routes led on by bloody youth, guarded with rags and countenance by boys and beggary, I say, if damned commotion so appeared in his true native and most proper shape, you, Reverend Father, and these noble lords had not been here to dress the ugly form of base and bloody insurrection with your fair honors. You, Lord Archbishop, who sees by a civil peace maintained, whose beard by the silver hand of peace hath touched, whose learning and good letters peace hath tutored, whose white investments figure innocence. 
the dove and very blessed spirit of peace, wherefore do you so ill translate ourselves out of the speech of peace that bears such grace into the harsh and boisterous tongue of war? Turning your books to graves, your ink to blood, your pens to lances, and your tongue divine to a trumpet and a point of war. Wherefore do I do this? So the question stands. Briefly, to this end, we are all diseased. And with our surfeiting and wanton hours have brought ourselves into a burning fever. And we must bleed for it. Of which disease our late King Richard being infected, died. But my most, most noble Lord of Westmoreland, I take not on me here as a physician, nor do I as an enemy to peace troop in the throngs of military men, but rather show a while like fearful war to diet rank minds sick of happiness and purge the obstructions which begin to stop our very veins of life. Hear me more plainly. I have an equal balance justly weighed what wrongs our arms may do, what wrongs we suffer, and find our griefs heavier than our offenses. We see which way the stream of time doth run, and are enforced from our most quiet there by the rough torrent of occasion, and have the summary of all our griefs, when time shall serve to show in articles, which ere long we offered to the king, and might by no suit gain our audience. When we are wronged and would unfold our griefs, we're denied access to his person, even by those men that have most done us wrong. The dangers of the days, but newly gone, whose memory is written on the earth with yet appearing blood, and the examples of every minute's instant, present now, hath put us in these ill-beseeming arms, not to break peace, or any branch of it, but to establish here a peace indeed, concurring both in name and quality. When ever yet was your appeal denied? Wherein have you been galled by the king? What peer hath suburned to grate on you that you should seal this lawless, bloody book of forged rebellion with a seal divine and consecrate commotion's bitter edge? My brother general, the commonwealth, to brother born and household cruelty, I take my quarrel in particular. There is no need of any such redress, or if there were, it not belongs to you. Why not to him in part, and to us all that feel the bruises of these days before, and suffer the condition of these times, to lay a heavy and unequal hand upon our honours? My good Lord Mowbray, construe the times to their necessities, and you shall say indeed, it is the time, and not the king, that doth you injuries. Yet, for your part, it not appears to me, either from the king or in the present time, that you should have an inch of any ground to build grief on. Were you not restored to all the Duke of Norfolk's signories, your noble and right well-remembered fathers? What thing in honor had my father lost that need to be revived and breathed in me? The king that loved him as the state stood then was force perforce compelled to banish him. And then that ha Harry Bolingbroke and he, being mounted and both roused in their seats, their neighing courses daring of the spur, their armored staves in charge, their beavers down, their eyes of fire sparking through sights of steel and the loud trumpet blowing them together, then, then, when there was nothing could have stayed my father from the breast of Bolingbroke, and when the king did throw his warder down, his own life hung upon the staff he threw. He threw, he, he down himself and all their lives that by indictment and by dint of sword hath since miscarried under Bolingbroke. You speak, Lord Mowbray, now you know not what. The Earl of Hereford was reputed in. in England, the most valiant gentleman. Who knows on whom fortune would have then smiled? But if your father had been victor there, he ne'er had borne it out of Coventry. 
For all the country in a general voice cried, Hate upon him, and all their prayers and love were set on Hereford, whom they doted on and blessed and graced indeed more than the king. But this is mere digression from my purpose. Here I come from our princely general to know your griefs and to tell you from his grace that he will give you audience, and wherein it shall appear that your demands are just. You shall enjoy them. Everything set off that might so much as think you enemies. But he hath forced us to compel this offer, and it proceeds from policy, not love. Well, but you overween to take it so. This offer comes from mercy, not from fear. For lo, within a can our army lies upon mine honor all too confident to give admittance to a thought of fear. Our battle is more full of names than yours. Our men are more perfect in the use of arms. Our armor, all is strong. Our cause is best. Then reason with our heart should be as good. Say you not then, our offer is compelled. Well, by my will, we shall admit no parley. That argues but the shame of your offense. A rotten case abides no handling. As to Prince John, a full commission, in very ample virtue of his father, to hear and absolutely to determine of what conditions we shall stand upon? That is intended in the general's main. I muse you make so slight a question. Then take, my lord of Westmoreland, this schedule, for this contains our general grievances. Each several article herein redressed, all members of our cause, both here and hence, that are insinued to this action, acquitted by a true substantial form and present execution of our wills to us and to our purposes confined, we come within our awful banks again and knit our powers to the arm of peace. This will I show the general. Please you lords, in sight of both our battles we may meet, and either end in peace, which God so frame, or to the place of difference called the swords which must decide it. My lord, we will do so. There is a thing within my bosom tells me there no conditions of our peace can stand. Fear you not that? If we can make our peace upon such large term and so absolute as our conditions shall consist upon, our peace shall stand as firm as Rocky Mountain. Yea, but our valuation shall be such that every slight and false derived cause, yea, every idle, nice and wanton reason shall to the king taste of this action, that were our royal faith's martyrs in love, we shall be winnowed with so rough a wind that even our corn shall seem as light as chaff and good from bad find no partition. No, 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 my lord. Note this, the king is weary of dainty and such picking grievances, for he hath found to end one doubt by death revives two greater in the heirs of life. And therefore will he wipe his tables clean and keep no telltale to his memory that may repeat and history his loss to new remembrance. For full well he knows he cannot so precisely weed this land as his misdoubts present occasion. His foes are so enrooted with his friends that plucking to unfix an enemy, he doth unfasten and so shake a friend. So that this land, like an offensive wife that hath enraged him on to offer strokes, as he stroking, striking holds his infant up and hangs resolved correction in the arm that was upreared to execution. Besides, the king has wasted all his wrath on late offenders, that he now does lack the very instruments of chastisement. So that his power, like to a thankless lion, may offer, but not hold. It is very true. And therefore be assured, my good Lord Marshal, if we do now make our atonement well, our peace will, like a broken limb united, grow stronger for the breaking. Be it so. Here is returned, my Lord of Westmoreland. The Prince is here at hand. Pleaseth, your lordship, to meet his grace, just distance between our armies. Your grace of York, in God's name, then, set forward. Before, and greet his grace. My lord, we come. Act four, scene two.
You're well, you are well encountered here, my cousin Mowbray. Good day to you, gentle Lord Archbishop. And so to you, Lord Hastings, uh, and to all. My Lord of York is better showed with you when that your flock assembled by the bell encircled you to hear with reverence your exposition on the holy text, than now to see you here an iron man cheering a rout of rebels with your drum, turning the world to sword and life to death, that man that sits within a monarch's heart and ripens in the sunshine of his favor, would he abuse the countenance of the king? Alack, what mischiefs might he set a broach in shadow of such greatness? With you, Lord Bishop, it is even so. Who hath not heard it spoken, how deep you were within the books of God, to us the speaker in his parliament, to us the imagined voice of God himself, the very opener and intelligencer, between the grace, the sanctities of heaven, and our dull workings? Oh, who shall believe, but you misuse the reverence of your place, employ the countenance and grace of heaven, as a false favorite doth his prince's name, in deeds dishonorable? You've ta'en up under the counterfeited zeal of God the subject of the substitute, my father, and both against the peace of heaven and him have here upswarmed them. Good my lord of Lancaster, I'm not here against your father's peace. But as I told my lord of Westmoreland, the time misordered doth in common sense crowd us and crush us to this monstrous form. To hold our safety up, I sent your grace the parcels and particulars of our grief, the which hath been with scorn shoved from the court, whereon this hydra son of war is born, whose dangerous eyes may well be charmed to sleep and grant of our most just and right desires. And true obedience of this madness cured, stoop tamely to the foot of majesty. If not, we ready are to try our fortunes to the last man. And though we here fall down, we have supplies to second our attempt. If they miscarry, theirs shall second them. And so success of mischief shall be born, and heir from heir shall hold this quarrel up, whilst England shall have generation. You are too shallow, Hastings, much too shallow to sound the bottom of the aftertimes. Pleaseth your grace to answer them directly, how far forth you do like their articles. I like them all, and do allow them well, and swear here, by the honor of my blood, my father's purposes have been mistook, and some about him have been have too lavishly rested his meaning and authority. My lord, these griefs shall be with speed redressed upon my soul. They shall. If this may please you, discharge your powers unto their several counties, as we will ours. And here between the armies, let's drink together friendly and embrace, that all their eyes may bear these tokens home of our restored love and amity. I take your princely word for these redresses. I give it to you, and will maintain my word, and thereupon I drink unto your grace. Go, oh, Captain, and deliver to the army this news of peace. Let them have pay and part. I know it will please them. Hide thee, Captain. To you, my noble lord of Westmoreland. I pledge your grace, and if you knew what pains I have bestowed to breed this present peace, you would drink freely. But my love tea shall show itself more openly hereafter. Do not doubt you. I'm glad of it. Health to my lord and gentle cousin. Wish me health in very happy season, for I am on the sudden something ill. Against ill chances men are every merry, but heaviness foreruns the good event. Therefore be merry, cuz, since sudden sorrow serves to say thus, some good things come tomorrow. <laughs> Believe me, I am passing light in spirit. So much the worse if your own rule be true. Yeah! 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 Rendered, hark how they shout. Uh, this has been cheerful after victory. A peace is of the nature of a conquest, for then both parties nobly are subdued, and neither party loser. Go, my lord, and let our army be, be discharged too. And good my lord, so please you, let our trains march by us that we may peruse the men we should have coped with all. Good, go, good Lord Hastings, and ere they be dismissed, let them march by. I trust, Lords, we shall lie tonight together. No, cousin, wherefore stands our army still? The leaders, having charge from you to stand, will not go off until they hear you speak. They know their duties. 
My lord, our army is dispersed already. I can use for steers, I yoked. They take their courses east, west, north, south, or like a school broke up. Each hurries to his home or sporting place. Good tidings, my lord Hastings. For the rich, I do arrest thee, traitor of high treason. And you, Lord Archbishop, and you, Lord Mowbray, of capital treason, I attach you both. Is this proceeding just and honorable? Is your assembly so? Will you thus break your faith? I point thee none. I promised you a dress of these same grievances, whereof you did complain, which by my honor I will perform with the most Christian care. But for you rebels, look to taste the due, me for rebellion, and such acts as yours. Most shallowly did you these arms commence, fondly brought here, and foolishly sent hence. Strike up our drums, pursue the scattered stray, God and not we hath safely fought today. Some guard these traitors to the block of death, treason's true bed, and yield her up breath. Act four, scene three. What's your name, sir? Of what condition are you? And of what place, I pray? I'm a knight, sir, and my name is Colville de Dale. Well then, Colville is your name, a knight is your degree, and your place the Dale. Colville shall steal your name, a traitor your degree, and the dungeon your place, a place deep enough so shall you be still Colville of the Dale. Are you not Sir John Falstaff? As good a man as he, sir, whoever I am. Do you yield, sir, or shall I sweat for you? If I do sweat, they are drops of thy lovers, and they weep for thy death. Therefore, rouse up fear and trembling and do observance to my mercy. I think you are, Sir John Foster. And in thy thought, yield me. I have a whole school of tongues in this belly of mine, and not a tongue of them all speaks any other word but my name. And I have but a belly of any indifference. I was simply the most active fellow in Europe. My womb, my womb, my womb undoes me. Oh, here comes our general. The heat is past, follow no further now. Call in the powers, good cousin Westmoreland. Now Falstaff, where have you been all this while? When everything is ended, then you come. These tardy tricks of yours will on my life one time or other break some gallows back. I would be sorry, my lord, but it should be thus. I never knew yet, but rebuke and check was the reward of valor. Do you think me a swallow, an arrow, or a bullet? <laughs> Have I, in my poor and old motion, the expedition of thought? I have speeded hither with the very extremest inch of possibility. I have foundered nine score at odd posts, and here, travel tainted as I am, have in my pure and immaculate valor taken Sir John Colville of the Dale, a most furious knight and valorous enemy. But what of that? He saw me and yielded. That I may justly say, with the hook-nosed fellow of Rome, I came, saw, and overcame. It was more of his courtesy than your deserving. I know not. Yet here he is, and here I yield him. And I beseech your grace, let it be booked with the rest of this day's deeds. Or by the Lord, I will have it in a particular ballad else, with my own picture on top on it, Colville kissing my foot. To the witch course, if I be enforced, if you do not all show like guilt two pences to me, as I in the clear sky of fame or shine you as much as the full moon doth cinders of the element, which show like pins heads to her, Believe not the word of the noble. Therefore, let me have right, and let desert mount. Thine's too heavy to mount. Let it shine, then. Thine's too thick to shine. Let it do something, my good lord, that may do me good, and call it what you will. Is thy name Colville? It is, my lord. A famous rebel art thou, Colville. And a famous true subject took him. I am my lord, but as my betters are, and let me hither. Have they been ruled by me? You should have won them dearer than you have. I not know how they sold themselves, but thou, like a kind fellow, gavest thyself away gratis, and I thank thee for this. Now have you left pursuit? Retreat is made, and execution stayed. Send Colville with his confederates to York to present execution. Blunt lead him hence and see you guard him sure. 
And now dispatch me toward the court, my lords. I hear the king, my father, is sore sick. Our news shall go before us to her, his majesty, which cousin you shall bear to comfort him. And we with sober speed will follow you. Uh, my lord, I beseech you, uh, give me leave to go through Gloucester. And when you come to court, stand, my good lord, pray in your good report. Very well, Falstaff. I and my condition shall better speak of you than you deserve. I would you had but the wit. T'were better than your dukedom. Good faith, this same young sober-blooded boy doth not love me. Nor a man cannot make him laugh. Well, that's no marvel. He drinks no wine. There's never none of these demure boys come to any proof. A thin drink doth so overcool their blood and making many fish meals, they fall into a kind of male green sickness. And then when they marry, they get wenches. They're generally fools and cowards, which some of us should be too, but for inflammation. <laughs> a good sherry sack hath a twofold operation in it. It ascends me into the brain, dries me there, all the foolish and dull and curdy vapors which environ it, makes it apprehensive, quick, forgetive, full of nimble, fiery, and delectable shapes, which, delivered o'er to the voice, the tongue, which is the birth, becomes excellent wit. The second property of your excellent sherries is the warming of the blood, which, before cold and settled, left the liver white and pale, which is the badge of pusillanimity and cowardice. But the sherries warms it, makes it coarse from the inwards to the parts extreme. It illuminateth the face, which as a beacon gives warning to all the rest of this little kingdom, man, to arm. And then the vital commoners and inland petty spirits muster me all to their captain, the heart, who great and puffed up with this retinue doth any deed of courage. And this valor comes of sherries, so that skill in the weapon is nothing without sack. Well, that sets it a work, and learning a mere hoard of gold kept by a devil till sack commences it and sets it in act and use. Hereof comes it that Prince Harry is valiant. The cold blood he did naturally inherit of his father, he hath, like lean, sterile, and bare land, manured, husbanded, and tilled with excellent endeavor of drinking good and good store of fertile sherries, that he has become very hot and valiant. If I had a thousand sons, the first humane principle I would teach them should be to forswear thin potations and to addict themselves to sack. How now, Bardolph? The army is discharged and all gone. Let him go. I'll go through Gloucester, and there will I visit Master Robert Shallow, Esquire. I have him already tempering between my finger and my thumb, and shortly will I seal with him. Come, away! Act four, scene four. Now, lords, if God doth give successful end to this debate that bleeding at our, door, at our doors, we will our youth lead on to higher fields and draw no swords but what are sanctified. Our navy is addressed, our power collected, our substitutes in absence well invested, and everything lies level to our wish. Only we want a little personal strength and pause us till these rebels now afoot come underneath the yoke of government. Both which we doubt not, but your majesty shall soon enjoy. Humphrey, my son of Gloucester, where is the prince, your brother? I think he's gone to hunt, my lord, at Windsor. And how accompanied? I do not know, my lord. Is not his brother, Thomas of Clarence, with him? No, my good lord, he is in presence here. What would my lord and father? Nothing but well to thee, Thomas of Clarence. How chance thou art not with the prince thy brother? He loves thee, and thou dost neglect him, neglect him Thomas. Thou hast a better place uh, in his affection than all thy brothers. Cherish it, my boy and noble offices thou mayest effect of mediation after I am dead, between his greatness and thy other brethren. Therefore omit him not, blunt not his love, nor lose the good advantage of his grace 
by seeming cold or careless of his will, for he is gracious if he be observed. He hath a tear for pity and a hand, open as day for melting charity, yet notwithstanding, being incensed, he's flint, as humorous as winter and as sudden as flaws congealed in the spring of day. His temper, therefore, must be well observed. Chide him for faults and do it reverently. When thou perceive his blood inclined to mirth, but being moody, give him line and scope, till that his passions, like a whale on ground, confound themselves with working. Learn this, Thomas, and thou shalt prove a shelter to thy friends, a hoop of gold to bind thy brothers in, that the united vessel of their blood, mingled with venom of suggestion, as force per force, the age will pour it in, shall never leak though it do work as strong as aconitum or rush, rash gunpowder. I shall observe him with all care and love. Why art thou not at Windsor with him, Thomas? He is not there today. He dines in London. And how accompanied? Canst thou tell that? With poins and his other continual followers. Most subject is the fattest soil to weeds, and he, the noble image of my youth, is overspread with them. Therefore my grief stretches itself beyond the hour of death. The blood weeps from my heart when I do shape in forms imaginary the unguided days and rotten times that you shall look upon when I am sleeping with my ancestors. For when his headstrong riot hath no curb, when rage and hot blood are his counselors, when means and lavish manners meet together, oh, with what wings shall his affections fly towards fronting peril and opposed decay? My gracious lord, look beyond him quite. The prince but studies his companions like a strange tongue, wherein to gain the language tis needful that the most immodest word being looked upon and learned, which once attained your highness knows comes to no further use, but be known and hated. So, like gross terms, Prince Will, in the perfectness of time, cast off his followers, and their memory shall as a pattern or a measure live, by which his grace must meet the lives of others, turning past evils to advantages. Tis seldom when the bee doth leave her comb in the dead carrion. Who's here, Westmoreland? Health to my sovereign, a new happiness added to that I am to deliver. Prince John, your son, doth kiss your grace's hand. Mowbray, the bishop Scroop, Hastings, and all are brought to the correction of your law. There is now not a rebel sword unsheathed. But peace puts forth her olive everywhere. The manner how this action hath been borne, here, <clears throat> at more leisure, may your highness read with every course in this particular. O oh, Westmoreland, thou art a summer bird, which ever in the haunch of winter sings the lifting up of day. Look, here's more news. From enemies, heavens keep your majesty. And when they stand against you, may they fall as those that I have come to tell you of. The Earl Northumberland and the Lord Bartles, with the great power of English and of Scott, are by the sheriff of Yorkshire overthrown. The matter and true order of the flight, this packet, it please you, contains at large. And wherefore should these good news make me sick? Will fortune never come with both hands full, but write her fair words still in foulest letters? She either gives a stomach and no food, such are the poor in health, or else a feast and take away the stomach, such as are the rich that have abundance and enjoy it not. I should rejoice now at this happy news, and now my sight fails, and my brain is giddy. Oh, me, come near me now. I am much ill. Comfort your majesty. Oh, my royal father. My sovereign lord, cheer up yourself. Look up. Be patient, princes. You do know these fits are with his highness very ordinary. Stand from him. Give him air. He'll straight be well. No. No. He cannot long hold out these pangs. The incessant care and labor of his mind hath wrought the muir that should confine it in so thin that life looks through and will break out. 
The people fear me, for they do observe unfathered airs and loathly births of nature. The seasons change their manners as the year has had found some months asleep and leaped them over. The river hath thrice flowed, no ebb between, and the old folk, times doting chronicles, say it did so little time before that our great-grandsire Edward sicked and died. Speak lower, princes, for the king recovers. This apoplexy will certain be his end. I pray you, take me up and bear me hence into some other chamber. Softly, pray. Act four, scene five. Let there be no noise made, my gentle friends, unless some dull and favorable hand will whisper music to my weary spirit. Offer the music in the other room. Set me the crown of upon my pillow here. His eye is hollow, and he changes much. Less noise, less noise. Who saw the Duke of Clarence? I am here, brother, full of heaviness. How now? Reign within doors and none abroad. How doth the king? Seating ill. Heard he the good news yet? Tell it him. He has altered much upon the hearing of it. If he be sick with joy, he'll recover without physic. Not so much noise, my lords. Sweet prince, speak low. King, your father is disposed to sleep. Let us withdraw into the other room. Will it please your grace to go along with us? No. I will sit and watch here by the king. Why doth the crown lie there upon his pillow, being so troublesome a bedfellow? Oh, polished perturbation, golden care, that keeps the ports of slumber open wide to many a watchful night. Sleep with it now, yet not so sound, and, and half so deeply sweet as he whose brow with homely, big and bound, snores out the watch of night. O oh, majesty, when thou dost pinch thy bearer, thou dost sit like a rich armor worn in heat of day that scalds with safety. By his gates of breath, there lies a downy feather which stirs not. Did he suspire? That light and weightless down perforce must move. My gracious Lord, my father, this sleep is sound indeed. This is a sleep that from this golden wriggle hath divorced so many English kings. Thy due from me is tears and heavy sorrows of the blood, which nature, love, and filial tenderness shall, O oh dear father, pay thee plenteously. My due from thee is this imperial crown, which, as, as immediate as thy place and blood, derives itself to me. Lo, here it sits, which God shall guard and put the world's whole strength into one giant arm. It shall not force this lineal honor from me. Tis from thee will I to mine leave as tis left to me. Warwick, Gloucester Clarence. Doth the king call? What would your majesty? How fares your grace? Why did you leave me here alone, my lords? We left the prince, my brother here, my liege, who undertook to sit and watch by you. Prince of Wales, where is he? Let me see him. He is not here. This door is open. He has gone this way. He came not through the chamber where we stayed. Where, where is the crown? Who took it from my pillow? When we withdrew, my liege, we left it here. 
The prince hath taken it from hence. Go seek him out. Is he so hasty that he doth suppose my sleep, my death? Find him, my lord of Warwick. Chide him hither. This part of his conjoins with my disease and helps to end me. See, sons, what things you are. How quickly nature falls into revolt when gold becomes her object. For this the foolish, over-careful fathers have broke their sleep with thoughts, their brains with care, their bones with industry. For this they have engrossed and piled up the cankered heaps of strange achieved gold. For this they have been thoughtful to invest their sons with arts and martial exercises when like the bee culling from every flower the virtuous sweets, our thighs packed with wax, our mouths with honey, we bring it to the hive and like the bees are murdered for our pains. This bitter taste yield his engrossments to the ending father. Now where is he that will not stay so long till his friend's sickness hath determined me? My lord. I found the prince in the next room, washing with kindly tears his gentle cheeks. Such a deep demeanor and great sorrow that tyranny, which never cleft but blood, would by beholding him have washed his knife with gentle eye. He is coming in. But wherefore did he take away the crown? Lo, where he comes, come hither to me, Harry. Depart the chamber, leave us here alone. I never thought to hear you speak again. Thy wish was Father Harry to that thought. I stay too long by thee, I weary thee. Dost thou so hunger for mine empty chair that thou wilt needs invest thee with mine honors before thy hour be ripe, O oh, foolish youth? Thou seekest the greatness that will overwhelm thee. Stay but a little, for my cloud of dignity is held from falling with so weak a wind that it will quickly drop. My day is dim. Thou hast stolen that which, after some few hours, were thine without offense, and at my death thou hast sealed up my expectation. Thy life did manifest thou lovedst me not. And thou wilt have me die assured of it. Thou hidest a thousand daggers in thy thoughts, which thou hast wedded on thy stony heart to stab at half an hour of my life. What canst thou not forbear me half an hour? And get thee gone and dig my grave thyself. And bid the merry bells ring to thine ear that thou art crowned, not that I am dead. Let out the tears that should bedew my hearse be drops of balm to sanctify thy head, only compound me with forgotten dust. Give that which gave thee life unto the worms, pluck down my officers, break my decrees, from now a time has come to mock and form. Harry the fifth is crowned up, vanity! Down royal state, all you sage counselors' heads. And to the English court assemble now, from every region apes of idleness. Now neighbor confines purge you of your scum. Have you a ruffian that will swear, drink, dance, revel the night, rob, murder, and commit the oldest sins, the newest kind of ways? Be happy, he will trouble you no more. England shall double gild his treble guilt. England shall give him office, honor, might. For the fifth Harry from curbed license plucks. The muzzle of restraint and the wild dog shall flesh his tooth on every innocent. Oh, my poor kingdom, sick with civil blows when that my care could not withstand thy riots. What wilt thou do when riots is thy care? Oh, thou wilt be a wilderness again, 
peopled with wolves, thy old inhabitants. Oh, pardon me, my liege, but for my tears, the moist impediments unto my speech, I had forestalled this dear and deep rebuke ere you with grief had spoke, and I had heard the course of it so far. There is your crown, and he that wears the crown immortally long guard it yours. If I affect it more than as your honor and as your renown, let me no more from this obedience rise, which my most inward true and duteous spirit teacheth, this prostrate and exterior bending. God witness with me. When I here came in and found no course of breath within your majesty, how cold it struck my heart. If I do feign, oh, let me in my present wildness die and never live to show the incredulous world the noble change that I have purposed. Coming to look on you, thinking you dead, and, and dead almost, my leash, to think you were. I, I, I spake unto this crown as having sense, and thus upbraided it. The care on thee, depending, hath fed upon the body of my father. Therefore, thou best of gold art worst of gold. Other, less fine in carrot, is more precious, preserving life in medicine potable. But thou, most fine, most honored, most renowned, hath eat thy bearer up. Thus, my most royal liege, accusing it, I put it on my head, to try with it as with an enemy that had before my face murdered my father. The quarrel of a true inheritor. But if it did infect my blood with joy or swell my thoughts to any strain of pride, if any rebel or vain spirit of mine did with the least affection of a welcome give entertainment to the might of it, let God forever keep it from my head and make me as the poorest vassal is that doth with awe and terror kneel to it. Oh, my son, God put it in thy mind to take it hence, that thou mightst win the more thy father's love, pleading so wisely in excuse of it. Come, Harry, sit by my bed, and hear, I think, the very latest counsel that ever I shall breathe. God knows, my son, by what bypaths and indirect crooked ways I met this crown, and I myself know well how troublesome it sat upon my head. To thee it shall descend with bitter quiet, better opinion, better confirmation, for all the soil of the achievement goes with me into the earth. It seemed in me, but as an honor snatched with boisterous hand, and I had many living to upbraid, my gain of it by their assistances, which daily grew to quarrel and to bloodshed, wounding supposed peace, all these bold fears, thou seest with peril I have answered, for all my reign hath been but as a scene, acting that argument, and now my death changes the mode, for what in me was purchased falls upon thee in a more fairer sort. So thou the garland wearest successively. Yet though thou stand'st more sure than I could do, thou art not firm enough since griefs are green, and all my friends, which thou must make thy friends, have but their stings and teeth newly taken out, by whose fell working I was first advanced, and by whose power I well might lodge a fear to be again displaced, which to avoid, I cut them off and had a purpose now to lead out many to the holy land, lest rest and lying still might make them look too near unto my state. Therefore, my Harry, be it thy course to busy giddy minds with foreign quarrels, that action hence borne out may waste the memory of the former days. More would I, but my lungs are wasted so that strength of speech is utterly denied me. I came by the crown, O oh God, forgive me, and grant it may with thee in true peace live.
my gracious liege. You won it, wore it, kept it, gave it me. Then plain and right must my possession be, which I with more than with a common pain against all the world will rightfully maintain. Look, look, here comes my John of Lancaster. Health, peace, and happiness to my royal father. Thou bringst me happiness and peace, son John, but health, alack, with youthful wings is flown from this bare withered trunk. Upon thy sight, my worldly business makes a period. Where is my lord of Warwick? My lord of Warwick? Doth any name particular belong into the lodgings where I first did swoon? It is called Jerusalem, my noble lord. Ah, oh, be to God! Even there, my life must end. It hath been prophesied to me many years. I should not die but in Jerusalem, which vainly I supposed the Holy Land. But bear me to that chamber there I'll lie. In that Jerusalem shall Harry die. Act five, scene one. Oh, my cock and pie, sir, you shall not away tonight. Wh what, da Davy, I say? You must excuse me, Master Robert Shallow. I will not excuse you. You shall not be excused. Excuses shall not be admi admitted. There is no excuse shall serve. You shall not be excused. Why, Davy! Here, sir. Uh, Davy, 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 let me see, Davy. Um, uh, let me see, Davy. Um, 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 let me see. Yay, Mary, William Cook, bid him come hither. Sir John, you shall not be excused. Mary, sir, thus, those precepts cannot be served. Then again, sir, shall we sow the headland with wheat? With, with red wheat, Davy, but for, for William Cook, are, are there no young pigeons? Well, yes, sir. Here's now the smith's note for shoeing the plow horns. Oh, well, let it be cast and paid. Sir John, you shall not be excused. <laughs> now, sir, a new length to the bucket must be had, and, uh, sir, do you mean to stop any of William's wages about the sack he lost the other day at Hinkley Fair? I shall answer it. Uh, some pigeons, Davy, a couple of short-legged hens, a joint of mutton, and any pretty little tiny kickshaws. Tell William Cook. Doth the man of war stay all night, sir? Yes, Davy, I will use him well. A friend in the court is better than a penny in purse. You use his men well, Davy, for they are errant knaves and, and will backbite. Oh, no worse than their backbitten, sir. For they have marvelous foul linen. Well, well, conceded, Davy, about, about thy business, Davy. I, I beseech you, sir, to countenance William Visor of Wuncott against Clement Parkes of the Hill. Well, there is many complaints, Davy, against that Visor, that, that visor is an errant knave, on my knowledge. I grant your worship, he is a knave, sir, but, yeah, God forbid, sir, but a knave should have some countenance at his friend's request. An honest man, sir, is able to speak for himself, when a knave is not. I have served your worship, truly, sir, this eight years, and if I cannot once or twice in a quarter bear out and a knave against an honest man, I have very but little credit with your worship. The knave is mine honest friend, sir. Therefore, I beseech your worship, let him be countenanced. Uh, go to, Davy. I say he shall have no wrong. Look about, Davy. Where, where, where are you, Sir John? Come, come, come. Off with your boots. Give me your hand, Master Bardolph. I am glad to see your worship. Well, I thank thee with all my heart's kind, Master Bardolph, and welcome, my tall fellow. Come, Sir John. I'll follow you, good Master Robert Shallow. Bardolph, look to our horses. If I were sawed into quantities, I should make four dozen of such bearded hermit stabs as Master Shallow. It is a wonderful thing to see the semblance coherence of his men's spirits and his. They, by observing of him, do bear themselves like foolish justices. He, by conversing with them, 
is turned into a justice-like serving man. The spirits are so married in conjunction with the participation of society that they flock together in consent like so many wild geese. If I had a suit to Master Shallow, I would humor his men with the imputation of being near their master. If to his men, I would curry with Master Shallow that no man could better command his servants. It is certain that either wise bearing or ignorant carriage is caught. Those men take diseases, one of another. Therefore, let men take heed of their company. I will devise matter enough out of this shallow to keep Prince Harry in continual laughter, the wearing out of six fashions, which is four terms, or two actions, and shall laugh without intervaliums. <laughs> it is much that a lie with a slight oath and a jest, with a sad brow, will do with a fellow that never had the ache in his shoulders. Ah, you shall see him laugh till his face be like a wet cloak, ill laid up. No, John! I come, Master Shallow. I come, Master Shallow. Act five, scene two. How now, my lord, Chief Justice? Whither away? How doth the king? Feeding well. His cares are now all ended. I hope not dead. He's walked the way of nature to our purposes. He lives no more. Would his majesty had called me with him. Service that I truly did his life hath left me open to all injuries. Indeed, I think the young king loves you not. No, he doth not. I do not arm myself to welcome the condition of the time, which cannot look more hideously upon me than I have drawn it in my fantasy. Here come the heavy issue of dead Harry. That the living Harry had to the temper of him. The worst of these three gentlemen, how many nobles then should hold their places that must strike sail to spirits of vile sort? God, I fear all will be overturned. Good morrow, cousin Warwick. Good morrow. Good morrow, cousin. We meet like men that had forgot to speak. We do remember. But our argument is all too heavy to admit such men. Well, peace be with him that hath made us heavy. Peace be with us. Must we be heavier? Oh, good, my lord, you have lost a friend indeed, and I dare swear you borrow not that face of seeming sorrow. It is sure your own. Though no man be assured what grace to find, you stand in coldest expectation, and the sorrier would twere otherwise. Well, you must now speak Sir John Falstaff fair, which swims against your streams of quality. Sweet princes! What I did, I did in honor, led by the impartial conduct of my soul, and never shall you see that I will beg a ragged and forestalled remission. If truth and upright innocency fail me, I'll to the king my master that is dead, and tell him who hath sent me after him. Here comes the prince. Good morrow, and God save your majesty. This new and gorgeous garment, Majesty, sits not so easy on me as you think. Brothers, you mix your sadness with some fear. This is the English, not the Turkish court. You want me to go downstairs? Amarath and Amarath succeeds, but Harry, Harry. Yet be sad, good brothers, for by my faith, it very well becomes you. Sorrow so royally in you appears that I will deeply put the fashion on and wear it in my heart. Why then, be sad, but entertain no more of it, good brothers, than a joint burden laid upon us all. For me, by heaven, I bid you be assured, I'll be your father and your brother too. Let me but bear your love. I'll bear your cares, yet weep that Harry's dead, and so will I. But Harry lives, 
that shall convert those tears by number into hours of happiness. We hope no other from your majesty. No from your majesty. You all look strangely on me. And you most. You are, I think, assured I love you not. <clears throat> I am assured if uh, I be measured rightly. Your majesty hath no just cause to hate me. No. How might a prince of my great hopes forget so great indignities you laid upon me? What? Rate, rebuke, and roughly send to prison the immediate heir of England? Was this easy? May this be washed in leth and forgotten? I then did use the person of your father. The image of his power then lay in me. Whilst I was busy for the commonwealth, your highness pleased to forget my place. The majesty and power of law and justice, the image of the king whom I presented, and struck me in my very seat of judgment, whereon, as an offender to your father, I gave bold way to my authority and did commit you. If the deed were ill, be you contented. Wearing now the garland to have a son set your decrees at naught, to pluck down justice from your lawful bench, to trip the course of law and blunt the sword that guards the peace and safety of your person. Nay, more to spurn at your most royal image and mock your workings in a second body. Question your royal thoughts. Make the case yours. Be now the father and propose a son. See your most dreadful laws so loosely slighted. Hold yourself so by a son disdained and then imagine me taking your part and in your power soft silencing your son after this cold consideration sentence me and as you are a king speak in your state what i have done that misbecame my place my person or my liege's sovereignty you are right Justice, and you weigh this well. Therefore, still bear the balance and the sword, and I do wish your honors may increase till you do live to see a son of mine offend you and obey you as I did. So shall I live to speak my father's words. Happy am I that have a man so bold that dares do justice on my proper son and not less happy having such a son that would deliver up his greatness so into the hands of justice. You did commit me, for which I do commit into your hand the unstained sword that you have used to bear, with this remembrance, that you use the same with the like bold, just, and impartial spirit as you have done against me. There is my hand. You shall be as a father to my youth, my voice shall sound as you do prompt mine ear, and I will stoop and humble my intents to your well-practiced wise directions. And princes all, believe me, I beseech you, my father is gone wild into his grave, for in his tomb lie my affections, and with his spirit sadly I survive, to mock the expectation of the world, to frustrate prophecies, and to raise out wrought an opinion, who hath writ me down after my seeming. The tide of blood in me hath proudly flowed in vanity till now. Now doth it turn and ebb back to the sea, where it shall mingle with the state of floods, and flow henceforth in formal majesty. Now call we our high court of parliament, and let us choose such limbs of noble counsel that the great body of our state may go in equal rank with the best governed nation, that war or peace or both at once may be as things acquainted and familiar to us, in which you, Father, shall have foremost hand. Our coronation done, we will excite, as I before remembered, 
all our state. And God consigning to my good intents, no prince nor peer shall have just cause to say, God shorten Harry's happy life one day. Act five, scene three. Nay, nay, you shall see my orchard, where in an arbor we will eat a last year's pippin of my own graffing with a dish of caraways, oh, and so forth. Come, cousin Silence, and, and then to bed. Poor God, you have here a goodly dwelling and a rich. Oh, baron, 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 yes, beggars all, beggars all, Sir John. Uh, Mary, oh, good air. Uh, spread, spread, Davy, spread, Davy. Well, well said, Davy. This Davy serves you for good uses. He's your serving man and your husband. <laughs> a good, a good valet, a, a good valet, a, a very good valet, Sir John. By by the mass, I have drunk too much sack at supper. A good valet. Yes. Now, now, now sit down. Now, uh, sit down. Come, cousin. Ah, oh, sirrah, quoth thou we shall. Do nothing but eat and make good cheer. And praise God for the merry year when flesh is cheap and females dear and lusty lads roam here and there so merrily and ever among so merrily. Oh. There's a merry heart. <laughs> good master silence, I'll give you a health for that and on. Oh, give Master Bard off some wine, Davy. Mm, sweet sir, set. I'll be with you anon. Most sweet sir, set, set. Uh, Master Page, good Master Page, set, set. Proface, oh, what you want meat? We'll have in drink, uh, but you must bear the heart soul. Oh well, be merry, Master Bardolph, and my little soldier there. Be merry. Be merry, be merry. My wife has all. For women are shrewd, both short and tall, tis merry in hall when beards waggle, and welcome merry shrove tide, be merry, be merry. I did not think Master Silence had been a man of this metal. <laughs> Who, I? Have been merry twice, and once or more. Or There's now. a dish of leather coats for you. Davy! <laughs> Your worship, I'll be with you straight. A cup of wine, sir. A cup of wine that's brisk and fine, and drink a toad the lean in mine, and a merry heart lives longer. Well said, Master Silence. And we shall be merry, now come in the sweet of the night. Health and long life to you, Master Silence. Fill the cup and let it come. I pledge you a mile to the bottom. Honest Bardolf, welcome. If thou wantest anything and, and, and wilt not call, be shrew thy heart. Welcome, my little tiny thief. And welcome indeed, too. I'll drink to Master Bardolph and to all the cavalers about London. I hope to say London ere I die. And I might see you there, Davy. Oh, by the mass, you'll crack a quart together. Ha! Ah, ah, ha! Ah, you not, Master Bardolph? Yes, sir, in a pottle pot. Ah, by God. <laughs> oh, I thank thee, the name stick by thee. I can assure thee that A will not out. He is true bred. And I'll stick by him, sir. Oh, why, there spoke a king. Let nothing to be merry. Uh, look, who's at the door there? Oh, who knocks? By now, you've done me right. Do me right and dub me knights, Amingo, is not so. Oh, tis so. Is so? Why then, say an old man can do somewhat. <laughs> uh, uh, please, your worship, there's one pistol come from the court with news. From the court? Well, let him come in. How now, pistol? Sir John, God save you. What wind blew you hither, Pistol? Not the ill wind which blows no man to good. Sweet knight, thou art one of the greatest men in this realm. 
By your lady, I think, be but Goodman Puff of Barson. <laughs> Puff. Puff in my teeth. Most recreant coward face. Sir John, I am thy pistol and thy friend, and helter-skelter have I wrote to thee. And tidings do I bring, and lucky joys, and golden times, and happy news of peace. I pray thee now, deliver them like a man of this world. A fulcher of the world, and worldlings base, I speak for Africa and golden joys. O oh, base Assyrian knight, what is thy news? Let King Gofuta know the truth thereof. And Robin Hood, Scarlet, and John. <laughs> <laughs> shall Dunghill curs confront the Helicons? And shall good news be baffled? Then, Pistol, lay thy head in Fury's lap. Honest gentlemen, I know not your breeding. Why then lament therefore? Uh, give me pardon, sir. I if so, you come with news from the court. I, I take it there's but two ways either to utter them or to conceal them. Uh, uh, I am, sir, under the king in some authority. <laughs> under which king? Bellisonian? Speak or die. Under King Harry. Uh, Harry the fourth? Or the fifth? Harry the fourth. <laughs> A future for thine office. Sir John, thy tender lamb king now is king. Harry the fifth's the man. I speak the truth when pistol lies. Do this and fig me like the bragging Spaniard. What? Is the old king dead? <laughs> As nail and door. The things I speak are just. Away, Bardolph. Saddle my horse. Master Robert Shallow, choose what office thou wilt in the land. Tis thine. Pistol, I will double charge thee with dignities. Oh, joyful day. I would not take a knighthood for my fortune. What? I do bring good news. Carry Master Silence to bed. Master Shallow, my lord Shallow, be what thou wilt. I am fortune's steward. Get on thy boots. We'll ride all night. Oh, oh sweet pistol. Away, Bardolph. Come, pistol. Utter more to me, and withal devise something to do thyself good. Boot, boot, Master Shallow. I know the young king is sick for me. Let, let us take any man's horses. The laws of England are at my commandment. Blessed are they that have been my friends, and woe to my lord chief justice. Let vultures vile seize on his lungs also. <laughs> Where is the life that laid I led, say they? Why, here it is. Welcome these pleasant days. Act five, scene four. No, thou arrant knave, I would to God that I might die, that I would have thee hanged. Thou hast drawn my shoulder out of joint. The constables have delivered her over to me, and she shall have whipping cheer enough. I warrant her. There hath been a man or two lately killed about her. Nut hook, nut hook, you lie. Come on. I'll tell thee what, thou damned tribe visage rascal. And the child uh, I now go with. Seven. I can Harry, thou wert better thou hadst struck thy mother, thou paper faced villain. Oh, the Lord that Sir John were come. He would make this blo a bloody day to somebody, but I pray God the fruit of her womb is Harry. If it do, you shall have a dozen of cushions again. You have but eleven now. Come, I charge you both, go with me. For the man is dead that you and Pistol beat amongst you. I'll tell you what, you thin man in a censer. I will have you as soundly swinged for this, you blue bottle rogue, you filthy famished correctioner. If you not be swinged, I'll for swear half curls. Come, come. You, she knight errant, come. Oh, God, that right should thus overcome might. Well... Of sufferance comes ease. Come, you rogue, come, bring me to a justice. Aye, come, you starved bloodhound. 
Good man death, good man bones. Thou, Adamy, thou. Come, you thin thing. Come, you rascal. Very well. Act five, scene five. More rushes, more rushes. The trumpets have sounded twice. It will be two o'clock ere they come from the coronation. Dispatch, dispatch. Stand here by me, Master mm -hmm. Robert Shallow. Mm -hmm. I will make the king do your grace. I will leer upon him as I come by, and, and do but mark the countenance that he will give me. <laughs> God bless thy lungs, good knight. Come here, pistol. Stand behind me. Oh, if I had time to have made new liveries, I would have bestowed the thousand pound I borrowed of you. But tis no matter. This poor show doth better. This doth infer the zeal I had to see him. It does so. It shows my, my earnestness of affection. It does so. My devotion. It doth it, doth it, doth. As it were, to ride day and night and not to deliberate, not to remember, not to have patience to shift me. It is best certain. But to stand stained with travel and sweating with desire to see him, thinking of nothing else, putting all affairs else in oblivion, as if there were nothing else to be done but see him. Tis semper idem, for obsc hoc nihil est. Tis all in every part. Uh, tis so indeed. Mm -hmm. My knight, I will inflame thy noble liver and make thee rage thy doll and Helen of thy noble thoughts is in base durance and contagious prison, hailed thither by most mechanical and thirty hand, rouse up revenge from Ebon Den with fell electo snake, for doll is in, pistol speaks not but truth. I will deliver her. <laughs> there roared the sea and the trumpet clangor sounds. God save thy grace, King Hal, my royal Hal. The heavens guard thee and keep, most royal imp of fame. God save thee, my sweet boy. My Lord Chief Justice, speak to that vain man. Have you your wits? Know you what tis to speak? My King, my Jove, I speak to thee, my heart. I know thee not, old man. Fall to thy prayers. How ill white hairs become a fool and jester. I have long dreamed of such a kind of man, so surfeit swelled, so old, and so profane. But being awaked, I do despise my dream. Make less thy body hence, and more thy grace. Leave gormandizing. Know the grave doth gape for thee thrice wider than for other men. Reply not to me with a fool-born jest. Presume not that I am the thing I was, for God doth know. So shall the world perceive that I have turned away my former self. So will I those that kept me company. When thou dost hear I am as I have been, approach me, and thou shalt be as thou wast the tutor, and the feeder of my riots. Till then, I banish thee on pain of death, as I have done the rest of my misleaders, not to come near our person by ten mile. For competence of life, I will allow you that lack of means enforce you not to evil. And as we hear you do reform yourselves, we will, according to your strengths, and qualities give you advancement. Be it your charge, my lord, to see performed the tenor of our word. Set on. Master Shallow, mm. I owe you a thousand pounds. Yea, Mary, Sir John, uh, which I beseech you, let me have home with me. I can hardly be, Master Shallow. Do not grieve at this. I shall be sent for in private to him. Look you, he must seem thus to the world. Fear not your advancements. I will be the man yet that shall make you great. I cannot well perceive how, unless you should give me your doublet and stuff me out with straw, 
I, I beseech you, good Sir John, let me have five hundred of my thousand. Sir, I will be as good as my word. This that you heard was but a color. A color that I fear you will die in, Sir John. Fear no colors. Go with me to dinner. Come, Lieutenant Pistol. Come, Bardolph. I shall be sent for soon, at night. Go. Carry Sir John Falstaff to the fleet. Take all his company along with him. My lord. <laughs> My lord. I cannot now speak. I will hear you soon. Take them away. Si fortun mi tormenta, spero contenta. I like this fair proceeding of the king's. He hath intent his wanted followers shall all be very well provided for, but all are banished till their conversations appear more wise and modest to the world. So they are. The king hath called his parliament, my lord. He hath. I will lay odds that, ere this year expire, we bear our civil swords and native fire as far as France. I heard birds so sing, whose music, to my thinking, pleased the king. Come, will you hence? First, my fear. Then, my courtesy. Last, my speech. My fear is your displeasure, my courtesy, my duty, and my speech to beg your pardons. If you look for a good speech now, you undo me. For what I have to say is of my own making, and what indeed I should say will, I doubt, prove mine own marring. But to the purpose, and so to the venture. Be it known to you, as it is very well, I was lately here in the end of a displeasing play to pray your patience for it and to promise you a better. I meant indeed to pay you with this, which if like an ill venture it come unluckily home, I break and you, my gentle creditors, lose. Here I promised you I would be and here I commit my body to your mercies. Bake me some and I will pay you some, and, as most debtors do, promise you infin infinitely. If my tongue cannot entreat you to equip me, will you command me to use my legs? And yet that were but light payment to dance out of your debt. But a good conscience will make uh, any possible satisfaction, and so would I. All the gentle women here have forgiven me, if the gentle men will not, then the gentle men do not agree with the gentle women, which was never before seen in such an assembly. One word more, I beseech you. If you be not too much cloyed with fat meat, our humble author will continue the story with Sir John in it and make you merry with fair Catherine of France, where, for anything I know, Falstaff shall die of a sweat. Unless already I be killed with your hand, with your hard opinions. For Old Castle died a martyr, and this is not the man. My tongue is weary. When my legs are too, I will bid you good night, and so kneel down before you, but indeed to pray for the Queen. Thank you so much, everybody. This has been such a fantastic night. Now we're gonna take a moment and we're gonna run a curtain call. Uh, allow me to remind our actors that we are now in speaker view. Please open your microphone on your turn. Yes, open your cameras now, open your microphone on your turn and uh, make some sound so that everybody can see you. Uh, I'm going to start. We had a couple of actors who weren't able to stay for curtain call, but we wanna give them some acknowledgement. Tonight playing Shallow, we had John. And tonight, playing Henry IV, we had Kristen. And they both had to go before curtain call. Um, <laughs> the crown is here, but not the king. Um, tonight, playing, oh, in literally no particular order. I have written down our actors at complete random tonight. Um, tonight, playing Pistol, Westmoreland, and Davy, we had Jeremy. I agree. I was in this too much. 
<laughs> Tonight playing Bardolph and Lady Northumberland, we had Wendy. Thank you. Tonight playing the, the second drawer, Silence, and the second groom, we had Trisha. Thanks everyone, don't forget to donate. Playing the first drawer, Pato, and the first groom, we had Jake. Thank you for inviting me to your home. Playing Snare and Doll Tear Sheet, we had Molly. Thanks for watching, guys. Donate and come see Midsummer. Playing Mistress Quickly, Clarence, and doing the epilogue as the dancer, we had Michelle. Michelle? Sorry, I was muted. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Playing the Archbishop of York and Moldy, we had Chris E. Thanks very much. Good night. <laughs> Playing Gower, Warwick, and Bullcalf, we had Carl. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Playing the Servant, Fang, Harcourt, and First Beetle, we had Liz. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Playing Falstaff, we had Joe. Good night, everybody. Please donate to the center. Playing the Page and Lancaster, we had Vera. Thank you, and come see Midsummer. Playing uh, Morton, Poins, and Gloucester, we had Anna. Thank you, guys. Playing Travers, Mowbray, and Shadow, we have Roger. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much. Please donate if you can. Playing Lord Bardolph and Wart, we had Chris J. Hi, uh, thanks, uh, guys. Good night. Thank you. Playing Northumberland, Hastings, Feeble, and Colville, we had Steve. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Playing Rumor, Lord Chief Justice, and Lady Percy, we had Kelly. Thank you, everybody. And playing Prince Harry, we had Kevin. That is now King Henry V. Thank you very much. And thank you all for watching, please. Hey, thanks to those who have donated so far. And if you haven't yet, please do so. Thank you. And please, as we've said many times over, many of our actors consider the Center for Performing Arts in Rhinebeck to be our theatrical home. They are reopening. So we will have, uh, next week, we'll have Lady Windermere's Fan, uh, which is not Shakespeare, but is still awesome. Uh, the following week, we will do King Lear, the infamous show that Shakespeare wrote in quarantine, and it will be our season finale. So we will have King Lear on the 27th, thank you, the 27th. Uh, that will be our season finale. We will be taking a few weeks off. Please go attend Midsummer. There Midsummer Night's Dream opens July 7th. July 7th. It plays for two weekends. They are on an outdoor stage. Your ticket gets you a space on the yard where you can bring a picnic and just hang out. It'll be fantastic. Many of our actors are in this show. Um, I know we've got Molly and Vera and Joe and Jeremy and probably more people. There's a lot of people. Liz. Liz, thank you. Um, Janie has worked with us before. She's not here tonight, but she is in that show. Um, so there's a whole bunch of actors who've been working with us all through quarantine who are going to be in Midsummer. Uh, on, on this outdoor stage. So please, 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 if you have the ability and want to see live theater again, go visit Midsummer, uh, the weekends of July 7th and 13th. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much once again for joining us. We have thoroughly enjoyed uh, spending all of this time with you. Good night, Facebook land. Good night.